All right, we'd like to welcome everyone to the Ojai Unified School District Board meeting. If you could join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. As far as I'm aware, there aren't any uh, emergency additions or modifications to the agenda. Um, are, I'll move to approve the agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Aye. In the minutes, there were a few changes that are noted in here. Uh, two uh, typos and then a modification to a sentence on page four. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes as modified? Are there more comments? I'll move. For the 17th and the 24th, Kevin? For yes, both? for both. Yeah, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Aye. Again, our students are away for the summer. We just wish we were too. <laughs> Um, but we'll move ahead anyway. We'll Stop. Have some <laughs> elections coming up for a new student representative. Yeah, that's exciting. We'll have a whole new group of yeah, maybe. students. They maybe they are allowed to run again. So. Well, or we'll the seniors are gone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. We're looking forward to that. All right. So it's time for public comments. Um, and I, in no particular order, I I didn't play with the order. Um, I might later. Oh, Randy Haney said he had to go first. Yeah, Randy Haney. How's that? You're you're up for public comment. Oh, I didn't even hear roll call. Oh, we don't, we don't do, do roll call. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're a lot more casual than. And then I'll just go after him. On the, on the, sure. On the so you yeah. actually have oh, an item oh, if you're, and a presentation. If you're planning to talk to that item, then yeah. we can wait. Agenda, oh. Why don't we wait for you? I can do that too. I'm sorry. It's good exercise though, walking around. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I sometimes do that during the meetings too. All right. Uh, Jeff Kettleson. Hello. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, what happened in 2014 with the state legislature. They enacted LFCC priority number three. And uh, as a parent, I think this is just heaven because if, An if Andrew Cantwell and Hank Bankser had implemented it here, uh, we would be in heaven, believe me, because if you read LFCC priority number three, it falls under the QSF, Quality Schools Framework. And like I say, we would, we would be in paradise now inst instead of where we are because LFC, LFCC priority number three goes into depth on how Hank Bankser and Andrew Cantwell could have used parents in key management decisions in this school district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Is it Paul Ryle? Royal. Royal. Yes. I, I was conflicted as to whether there was a no there or not. Sorry about that. Welcome, Paul. I'm the only speaker. I'm just going to introduce the people with me. But uh, I'm Paul Royal, and we have lived uh, in this area since the 70s. Uh, we live in Upper Ojai, and I'm here tonight. Well, first of all, I want to thank each and every board member for the time and the efforts uh, and the energies that you put in. I know it's an unpaid position. You're volunteers. You do a phenomenal job, and we appreciate that. But I'm here representing uh, Summit Charter School. I'm the uh, vice president on that board. Uh, over the years, I've had six grandkids go through Summit. They got a great education. Three are now in university. One just graduated, and I've got three at Nordoff. One a senior that went through Summit. 
and two are junior. So all six did go through summit. We want to uh, work collaboratively with the board uh, on the, the possibility of a charter school in Upper Ojai so uh, parents have that choice of a public neighborhood school. I think that is important. Uh, when Summit was in operation, it attracted quite a number of students from Santa Paula. There's going to be large growth in Santa Paula, and I think it's going to just overpower the uh, existing public schools now. So we're going to get even more interest from uh, Santa Paula pulling from there. <clears throat> We've had, uh, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but we could probably do the research, but a number of those Santa Paula uh, people went on to graduate from Nordoff, and some are currently there. So. Uh, there would be that gain uh, from Santa Paula going into uh, Nordoff High School. We're looking at a charter, uh, K TK through 8th is what we'd like to do. So I'd, I'd like to introduce our board. <coughs> Nina Newley is on the board. Uh, Faith Mulqueen and Thea Wilcox, Kim Rivers. And we have two board members that are not here this evening, Teresa Zamora from Santa Paula. Uh, she has uh, a number of students uh, in Santa Paula that would be going to the charter school. She's also a graduate of uh, Summit School. And Andy Gilman, uh, who uh, helped start up a charter school in Ventura. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. And uh, Faith, did you want to speak also? Oh, I thought I was... You have, you have three minutes. <laughs> I guess I will. You turned I did because he told Sorry. me that I needed to if I wanted to speak. I thought we, we were, our intention is to introduce ourselves and um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I support the charter and I'm an educator, environmental policy major and I'm going to get my master's in education and I really look forward to creating win-win collaborative opportunities with the school board and working together to create schools and education that is really for the highest of all concerned. Thank you. All right, Jim Bailey. Uh, for the record, my name is Jim Bailey. I'm speaking as an individual, so I just want to say thank you to the board for your efforts. I want to say thank you to Tiffany for the third uh, in the series of engaging the community uh, on that topic of social, emotional connection with students. I think it's hugely important. Today, I want to share about a tool that I became aware of <coughs> On a visit to my daughter in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I visited a school out there that's a learner-centered school called Avalon. And um, the, the person who showed me around that day uh, showed me a software that they utilize to allow project-based learning to occur in an effective way to, to allow student-generated projects for most of the year uh, to, to meet standards-based requirements. And uh, it used to be called Edio. It's been changed recently to Head Rush. Um, I'm not sure. Is anybody on the board you're familiar with? Yeah. It? Okay. So um, I'm in dialogue with with the developer. He wants to give us a copy to experiment with, and you know I look forward to doing that and sharing that with you. I can say that when I was at Avalon and I was looking around at the student projects, uh, they they were phenomenal. They were everywhere around the campus, and I could see that. It created a real sense of pride and co-creation of the learning environment that I know would motivate students. Um, I like that it seemed to have an ability to drag and drop standards into projects, uh, um, kind of kiosks, and as those projects were finished, those standards would fill in for the various subjects. It, it seemed pretty phenomenal to me, and I know if I were in a regular classroom at this point, it would be something I would be extremely excited about using because it can address some of those needs that were brought up at uh, the last Engage to Impact because the anxiety issue is oftentimes because we have lack control, right? We're in a situation, somebody's telling us what we have to do, it might be too much, we might have other things that are happening, um, and, and we just can't keep up with all of it. So when we have anxiety and we have control and choice, it can lessen some of those things. And I think project-based learning would be a great way to do that too experiment in bringing that more into OUSD schools while meeting the needs of standard-based education. So thank you very much. Thank you. Out of curiosity, was yeah. it a private school, public school, charter school? It was a, 
It was a charter school. <laughs> it was a charter school. Um, they're a member of Education Reimagined. Oh, okay. And so I looked them up when I was back there, and uh, yes, that's what they were. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, moving on to 6.1. Uh, so, Randy, you want to start off? And then uh, Bill, and then Pat Hartman. He said, right. he did. Uh, good evening. <laughs> we appreciated those remarks, Randy. Right? No, I'm kidding. Oh, I'm still waiting for roll call. The buzzer call. went off. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'll be on. Um, I'll, I'll be short and, no, let, and, and give. You're up. good. Take, take no, as much time as you need. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I'll be short, and I'll, I'll be able to elaborate more on on the issue um, about cannabis or hemp being grown in the valley. Um, just a short take on it. We were um, contacted two weeks ago on a Thursday from a large group of people on Boardman Road regarding um, uh, the new hemp farm that's going to be going in. And um, so our responsibilities and my response was, was quickly, we didn't even know that, um, that they were allowing hemp to be grown here in, in the county. So just a, I'll give you a simple fact. Um, a year ago there were 300 acres under um, being under cultivation and, and a year later we got 3,000 acres. So I think it's a concern for the community that one, none of us even knew about it. Two, I think it's going to be a bigger concern for the school board, the fact that a lot of the, um, a lot of your uh, secondary, secondary schools are adjacent to large citrus groves. And right now they're uh, speculating that the return on investment is about $30,000 an acre. So um, my gut says, if I can make that much on, a, on an acre of hemp, um, what's my return on an acre of, of uh, citrus or of uh, our pixies? So I think there's going to be a transition. And I wasn't sure if the school board was aware of it, because we weren't aware of it. So um, I'm going to end my comments on that, the fact that um, it's a federally regulated or a federally regular a federally um, approved crop it's a California approved crop it's obviously a Ventura County approved crop and the emphasis on in Ventura County is crop production so I have a sense that this is going to get larger before it shrinks or gets smaller so that's a concern and I think this whole community needs to be concerned about it thank you I don't know you guys, but August is supposed to be a little more peaceful. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, two weeks ago we um, we found out that uh, the county ag commissioner has decided, as a minority of counties in the state, by the way, that um, they uh, the ag commissioner, without public review and without public process, would start issuing permits for and without any regulations of any kind other than a right to grow would start issuing permits for industrial hemp in Ventura County. And it's here. If you've driven past Pyre lately, look to the right. There's a shade of green in that field that we haven't seen before. And you'll see big old signs that say industrial hemp, no trespassing, and a big old red circle and a red bar saying no THC. You know, hopefully the teenagers will understand that. Um, but anyway, it's here. We have hundreds of acres already uh, in cultivation. And we also, I want to juxtapose to that, is we had an experience in Santa Barbara County with Carpinteria High School. And I would have thought that the county would have recognized that before, you know, rather than just allowing an administrative silo to make public policy, would have had some sort of public process, public hearings before rolling out um, industrial hemp permits by right and ministerially uh, without any regulations, without any buffer zones, without anything, apparently. And so what uh, has happened, of course, is that Mitch McConnell sponsored uh, legislation to get through the federal government to allow, uh, enable industrial hemp nationwide. The state of California jumped on it right away, and the uh, uh, county of Ventura um, immediately uh, started taking uh, registrations uh, according to these state regulations that just as a few months ago occurred and um, is starting to issue these these permits 
Um, and again, um, to emphasize, the majority of counties in the state of California, and then there's a good, um, there's an article in the OC Register dated uh, 514 of 19 that states uh, very clearly that the majority of counties in the state of California do not believe, and our city attorney, by the way, we've already asked him to engage, believes that the state regulations do not preempt county land use authority. That if the county want, it wishes to exercise that land use authority, they can do so. That's the belief of the majority of counties in the state of California and our city attorney. That is not the position of the current Board of Supervisors, and that is not the, uh, that is not the position of the uh, Ag Commissioner, who believes <coughs> this is completely within his silo. The immediate image that Randy and I came up with was San Antonio School surrounded by industrial hemp, which in fact is the current policy position of the County of Ventura, of that being okay, of that being allowed to happen. Our odors coming in from uh, just east of uh, the city limits into Topo Topo School, for example, or we have residential areas with no buffer zone whatsoever. That is the current position. All right. Can you, um, sorry, I have a cold. Yeah. Can you expand for us what are, what are the issues surrounding, you know, versus a field of corn, what, what happens to the, com to the area with a field of hemp? Well, why is it a concern for us? I would suggest talking to the Carpinteria High School people, okay. if you want to know what the issue is. And the point is, is I, not, I do not, we do not know, although I have talked to people involved in the industrial hemp world, and they do agree there is an odor matter with industrial hemp, just like there is with cannabis in general, uh, that includes uh, for other products. Industrial hemp has very small fractional percentage of THC, so it's not a psychoactive product. It's for feed and animal feed and so on and so forth, fiber, but it does have odor. So the biggest issue is odor, and there are other issues uh, going on, but I would say the biggest issue uh, is um, the experience that Carpenter High School had, uh, which really degraded the quality of, of uh, the educational experience, I think, if you talk to anybody in Carpenteria before they kind of took some measures to get up on top of that. I think that's the biggest issue. Okay. So, Bill, in yeah. terms of the county permitting and stuff, there's, mm -hmm. there's no discussion about any kind of an environmental review or anything? No. They, uh, the Ag Commissioner viewed it as a ministerial right to grow, sure, like any other product, like any other, any other crop, without any, with, uh, let me back up a little bit, okay? One of the issues the city has had with the county in general is not respecting something called the guidelines for orderly development, which is something adopted by LAFCO that Ventura County agrees to, that they are supposed to notify the city of changes in land use policy at the very least, and to be consistent with uh, uh, City of Ojai land use policies within a very narrow sphere of influence, but at least notify us in the entire valley for the area of interest. None of that occurred. No notification whatsoever. Um, their belief is that it's not a land use issue, apparently. The Ag Commissioner's viewpoint. And we disagree with that, and we feel that um, it's important and again, to uh, uh, quote our city attorney, the state law and regulations do not expressly preempt the county and any city's underlying land use power, meaning the county could still choose to prohibit or regulate industrial hemp growing as part of exercising its land use powers, et cetera. I, I, just wanted, I wanted to The county's on. position is it's like any other crop. There is a notification process. Of? A, a small one, a small but it's not what we would think the notification is. Right. If I'm buying a house adjacent to hemp cultivation, it's up to the real estate agent to notify me. That's right. the extent of it. That's the only notification. Right. It has nothing to do with um, an individual changing crop. It right. just has to do with changing. That's that's I think the county's interpretation. That's not our interpretation. Right. So, and so just to kind of cut to the chase here. Um, we would urge, I think, he can descend at point. I, I would urge, I think, as we Randy agreed with, that you as a board empower your superintendent to engage what is going to be happening 
uh, at the local level. I think partially, maybe solely because of our efforts. Uh, an industrial hemp working group has been convened beginning this Friday at 10 a.m. in Camarillo. We offered city council chambers for us to have a public information session uh, that would be live streamed and, you know, and on Channel 10 and everything for the Ohio Valley. Uh, that was not taken advantage of. The no. county did not wish to do that. They want us to go to Camarillo and, um, instead. But I would urge that, that this board, if it felt like it, it, it's within its authority on the agenda, to uh, empower your superintendent to engage concerns with the uh, uh, industrial hemp working group to contact other school boards, our school superintendents about the issue. And in fact, statewide, um, on the 28th, is the, um, uh, can, let's see, um, let me get to this in a second. The uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture is having a uh, review. They're, they're empowered to implement the California Industrial Hemp Law. And they are going to be having a uh, Industrial Hemp Advisory Board and all interested stakeholders to meet uh, Wednesday, August 28th at 9.30 a.m. at the California Department of Food and Agriculture in Sacramento. I would think representatives of the statewide school board association might want to be there um, because this is a quality of life matter as far as I'm concerned. It's ironic since, you know, to some degree I was one of the biggest proponents for regulated cannabis in the valley for me to be raising the alarm about this, but I think the bottom line is regulation. Public process, public education, public accountability, and regulation. And what I am uh, take exception with is the county, and this I could give other examples, but the county once again kind of taking the, uh, the approach of these administrative silos by default making decisions without public process and without addressing public concerns. And uh, so at the very least, um, uh, I, I would hope that, that the school board could, might, might ask the superintendent to engage in this respect both at the state level and the local level to at least uh, get the, uh, you know, gather information, promote public hearings, and um, hopefully we won't be surprised one day by having San Antonio uh, School surprise, you know, surrounded by industrial hemp and the resultant odors. Because Randy and I, and I think everyone in the, on, the, on the city council wants to do whatever we can to work with the school board to promote enrollment, to promote your staff, and the faculty wanting to work here, want, uh, to promote an environment, uh, to uh, you know improve our, our public school system, uh, writ large, education in general, and somehow not having public processes about in, in, you know important environmental issues around the public schools uh, doesn't seem like it really serves that end. So that's what I would urge the uh, the board to do to let your superintendent engage on this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Pat, before you come up, our superintendent has some more presentation on this, and then we'll have you talk, because that's okay. So just tell you, uh, when Mr. Weirich contacted me, I did a little bit of research on this, and so I'll, I'll supplement essentially what he said, um, which is first and foremost, we're talking about the growing of industrial hemp, not cannabis. Cannabis is not allowed commercially in Ventura County, so any crop that is industrial hemp goes through the permitting process and then is tested, if it tests for uh, a certain amount of THC, they destroy the crop because it's um, cannabis and, and not industrial hemp. So there's no restriction from the USDA or the state of California regarding grow, uh, growing of industrial hemp, uh, mostly because of Prop 64. Therefore, it's treated like any other crop. Like all of our agriculture, there's no official buffer zone between agriculture and our schools. Um, there is this small rule about pesticide use and the spraying of pesticides between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, with advance notice, et cetera, et cetera, um, which they utilize a lot in, in Oxnard, in the Oxnard area. Um, but because there's no pesticides used in the growing of industrial hemp, that, that doesn't apply in this particular case. So um, the permitting process is to go to the county. Here are the current, and I'm sorry, this is very hard to use, but here are the current permitted areas within the Ojai Valley. So you can see, I um, actually had these on a screenshotted, but that didn't work out. So there's 
a couple right there. If you are to click on this map, you can see it tells you who's growing it and how many acres. So this one is six acres. This one down here is um, 1.2 acres. And then there's- Are those both on board? Are these what? Both on board, man? Um, yes. Yes. Yes, on board, man. Yeah. Opposite the park. Right. Right. And then there's another one that is, um, forgive my clunky scrolling here, and I was hoping no one would ask me specific questions about where these are because I would tell you I don't know after living here for a month all of the nuances <laughs> of where this is, but um, here's the other farm here. There's three, and um, this one is 1.64 acres. This one is... Um, another 1.64 acres and then there's one more little one so and again right adjacent to a residential area right so so these are the the currently permitted area areas there's another one that's in the by wheeler but by um, permitted you mean intent to these are the registered um industrial hemp production farms right. in the right. Ohio Valley right now the county's position is all you have to do is to meet state regs register and you have a permit these, well, are these are already here, right? We, you know, we or uh, are permitted and will will be here. So when I asked the ag commissioner about the the notification process, and he said, "Well, uh, you are welcome to attend the meeting on Friday, in which the working group meeting to to discuss your concerns." So um, there is not an official notification process, although I assume I could call every two weeks and ask for this map. Well, uh, our city manager is going to attend the meeting on Friday, but um, more importantly, this is not going to be about can they grow it or can they not. This is going to be a, a, a political battle over where they grow it, when they grow it, and how close do they grow it to our public schools, as well as to residential neighborhoods. And whether we can mobilize the political will at the county level to exercise the regulatory land use authority that is inherent that they right now are not choosing to exercise. So there are other schools and districts that have worked with the county um, to develop a county ordinance that have particular setbacks. Um, one of them is a thousand feet, one of them is a half a mile. Um, and so there, there are cases of the, the school district working collaboratively with the, with the county to, to put some but this here is an uh, information item, so yes. we really couldn't be directing you to do something. This we is say, yes, right. we'd like to direct you to something on the next board. Uh, I think it well, is information item. We often direct the superintendent to do things yeah. that aren't by vote. Right. It's just, uh, You're just like, can you go get us a report on something, or can you go to a meeting? I do think this is a concern. It's very interesting. Right after I heard that this was going to be on the agenda, there was a big article in the Santa Barbara paper. Um, because Santa Barbara County went in with both feet with eyes completely closed. Exactly. Um, and they are regretting the hell out of their decision now because neighborhoods are being skunked out. I mean, the, the, the odor is not just pervasive. I mean, ag, everybody knows if you live in an ag area, you're going to get a little overspray, you're going to get a little crop aroma. Well, the smell of pixies is a lot more pleasant <laughs> than the skunky smell of an acre of cannabis or, or hemp because they apparently smell the same. Um, so I think, you know, along the lines of, no, we probably can't keep things out, but we probably should be able to argue for odor mediation or setbacks or locational stuff. I mean, we talk about where liquor stores are going to go and all that kind of stuff. So when your crop encroaches, right, I mean, if you can keep your crop on your land, that's great. But if your crop is going to encroach on everybody around you and potentially the entire valley, then that's a pretty big deal, it seems to me. Wow. Yeah. The problem, though, is is with the setbacks, a thousand feet isn't going to keep an odor away, yeah, even a half a mile. If you drive through on the freeway through Carpinteria in the evening, you know exactly mm -hmm. where you are. <laughs> it's right on the freeway. You don't have to go near. That's more than a half a mile from where they're growing it, so I'm not sure. But none of them, as near as I can tell, what I have heard from the article, are doing any kind of odor control or filtration or anything. And, I mean, we have the technology for that. Other other industries have to do that. Why don't we let 
pad talk, and then we'll pick up our conversation. (laughs) I appreciate that you've taken this on and are looking at it because it's a pretty serious issue for the whole valley and especially for the schools. Um, We live on Boardman Road, and we're farmers. We grow pixie tangerines, so. you know, we, we believe in the right to farm, but the right to farm was originally established uh, to protect farmers from housing developments coming next to them and then complaining about farming. But we're having the opposite problem now. People who want to f- grow industrial hemp are coming into residential neighborhoods, which ours is, right next to the Sieta Robles track, and um, producing a crop that is very objectionable because the smell is horrible. You, as you pointed out, you could smell it from the freeway in um, Carpinteria. Just to clarify what hemp is, this is not your grandfather's hemp that they're growing to make clothing or rope or something like this. This is industrial hemp that's been genetically engineered to have more um, oil so they can produce CBD oil. That's what it's being sold for. That's why they can make up to 50,000 acre on um, hemp. You can't make that on pixies, believe me. It was legalized in April of this year in the state of California, and as they so eloquently pointed out, our uh, county supervisors have placed no restrictions, no restrictions on where it can be grown. Where it's been planted on Boardman Road is within, from here to there, of a house, you know. And you can imagine what that's going to do to property values, you know, when that stink is in the air. Who wants to live next to a hemp grow? You know, nobody. Um, Up in Carpinteria, that has become the poster child for what can go wrong with no restrictions. The schools there, um, the students are, they have to have this pervasive smell around them all the time. The teachers have to come in the morning, air out the classrooms so the kids can even breathe. When sports teams come to play football or something, they have to notify the sports team that they're going to have to breathe that odor. The kids are getting sick up there. That smell causes headaches, nausea, um, respiratory issues. It's not healthy to breathe that smell. And you can imagine kids trying to study in the middle of a big stink. Um, And kids are transferring out of those schools. The last thing we need in Ojai is kids transferring out of our schools with declining enrollment already. You know know parents in Ojai, they're not going to want their kids to be sitting breathing that odor all day long. Um, Another thing that I don't think has been well known yet in the community is, for example, we're growing pixie tangerines just down the street from this hemp grow. We are required to spray our trees for the Asian citrus psyllid, which we're in a fight to keep citrus alive in this valley. Um, Industrial hemp cannot have any pesticides because it's ingested. So who wins that battle? You know, we, we're required to spray before they will pick our fruit by the Farm Bureau and the packing houses will pack it. And what if the guy down the street who's growing it says, well, you can't spray for that because it'll affect my crop. And this has happened in Carpinteria. The avocado growers, the sprayers will not come in because they're being sued by the marijuana growers there. Um, so. It's, there's been lawsuits flying back and forth. So picture, you're a pixie grower in Ojai. Some guy plants hemp right next to you because there's no restrictions. And then he says, you cannot spray your crop. So, you know, there's a lot of unproductive grows in Ojai already. You know, Valencia grows that aren't making any money. Um, if that happens and those grows say, well, heck, I can make a heck of a lot more. I'll just cut my grove down and grow hemp right next to your school, right next to your house. Also, Ojai is a closed system air-wise. Remember how the smoke from the Thomas fire just stayed here much longer than anywhere else? We can't get rid of pollutants in the valley of Ojai very easily. So the whole valley could potentially smell like skunk, you know, like Carpinteria does right now. Like you said, you can smell it from the freeway. Um, What's that going to do to our tourist industry? What's that going to do to our property values in this valley? Um, (laughs) 
The other thing that I think people aren't thinking about is that the citrus orchards in the Ojai Valley, that's our tree canopy. They're like the rainforest. You know, it attracts moisture. It produces, it oxygenates the air. If those orchards get cut down, hemp is not going to do that. It's planted for 100 days, and then it's cut down. So we're going to lose our tree canopy, and the whole Ojai Valley will become much more desert-like because it won't be attracting the rain. And you know how we need rain in this valley. So anyway, I would just really encourage the school board to be proactive and petition the county supervisors to place some reasonable restrictions on where hemp can be grown, um, especially around schools, houses, parks. This first hemp grow on Boardman Road is right next to Seoul County Park, right next to houses, you know, right next to competing agriculture. Um, it doesn't belong there. It maybe belongs on the Oxnard Plain where there's no houses, schools, parks nearby. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Any comments? Any it's additional a, comments? Legitimate concern. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I guess I'm in favor of uh, making a statement. Yeah, and further, I mean, I, I, I like the idea of uh, Tiffany pursuing it. Um, I cannot go this Friday or yeah. any day that's so close to the opening of school, um, but after school opens, I can definitely um, engage around this issue. And um, Bill, is there a resolution that's being prepared that potentially could come back to this board for them to sign on for support? Yes, unfortunately we canceled a bunch of meetings in August uh, and so we were kind of caught flat-footed at, at the council that we will be. Uh, I'll work with you, okay, we'll get the city manager and myself to work with you on that. Do, do we know where Supervisor Bennett is on this? Uh, I just, Bill does. I'm sorry, and I probably should go to the microphone and follow my own advice. Um, <clears throat> but I also think it's worth considering uh, kind of putting the word out to other school districts and contacting at the school board level at the state. So the I've state. talked to other superintendents about this already. Yeah. Um, and at least the ones that like Ventura and Oxnard where yeah. this would be a problem. So uh, uh, yeah, we have not put a resolution together yet because we're, we canceled our meetings in August <laughs> and this happened, but we will be. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a potential negative impact to students in our school. So I think it's worth, worth pursuing. And, uh, and we're stronger together than apart on this kind of thing. So maybe um, I'll keep this on the agenda for the next meeting, and we can either receive an update or action depending on what's available at that time. And I would like to see more than just to setbacks as a solution. You know, if there's some odor mitigating something that would actually make it less cost effective to grow hemp in the, the state, right. that would be nice. Right, exactly. Um, and you know, it, yep, the and as they say in economics, make people, you know, have to pay for their externalities and right. then they'll make better economic decisions. Right. And the other thing that, that um, Ms. Hartman didn't mention, she mentioned about the, the ecological aspect of groves. There's also a fire safety issue. That's what I was thinking. Irrigated citrus groves do not carry fire. Yeah. I have a feeling hemp might, but we don't know. That's the problem. We don't know. You mentioned the odor mitigating in um, carpentria. They, they can mitigate the odor a little bit because it's going in greenhouses. But this is grown out in the field. Mm -hmm. They cannot mitigate that. We, we, have a, uh, we have a joint session coming up with you. Um, probably within the next month, if not coming, to, if, if, if not the first or the second or third week in uh, September, um, I would think that you guys might agendize something and then gather as much information from the school body as you can, because Bill and I are going to be working on what we can do within the city, and that would be a good place to exchange some ideas and exchange some uh, um, more information with one another. Great. Like a long agenda here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and moving on to 6.2, a present. I just want yeah. to say, I mean, it's very concerning. And, you know, based on what I know now, I'm very concerned. So, uh, presentation about nutrition services. All right. So, I would like to invite Julie to come and talk to you, and um, Lori 
Lori here. Lori's here. Up there you are. Didn't see you. Uh, and Lori Hammer from Food for Thought. They are going to present to you some information about um, some of the exciting changes that we have in our nutrition services department coming up this year, kind of in line with the vision that we've set around all kids having access to healthy food. Do you need help, Julie? Um, while Julie gets that set up, we could actually do one. We could also the next item, the next presentation is not very long. So we do that? To do that and then go back to six point why don't while you're setting that up, why don't we do six point three, the presentation regarding San Antonio as the newly designated Title One school? Um, San Antonio will become our seventh school that will re receive Title I funds. And it's as a result of their um, free and reduced lunch numbers, which were 44% um, of their school. So now all seven schools are Title I schools, and so San Antonio will also operate a school-wide program which, as you remember, I think I explained it before, school-wide program is where um, it's really comprehensive. It's a comprehensive <coughs> strategy rather than these add-on services. And I think that comprehensive strategy is really the most effective to raise the academic achievement. So um, that's it. Any questions about San Antonio added, adding um, being added to Title I. Just a clarifying question. Sure. Um, this says that the only reason that the San Antonio is a Title I is the percent of low-income students. Correct. That's not connected to the academic achievement or anything else? No. no. Also, Marilla, um, when we say 44%, that's based on the self-identification, right? Yes, on so, the free and reduced lunch right. forms. So it could I think based on our history of not always being able to identify all of the students that would qualify for free and reduce, we can only assume it's even a higher percentage, right? Right, and uh, Robin did a really good job. This is based on 1819, mm -hmm. and Robin did a really good job of um, individually reaching out to families to encourage them to fill out the application, and I think it really... Um, produced results. And overall, although our schools are Title I designation, our, all seven schools are Title I, in terms of our LCFF funding, their supplemental and concentration, concentration funding, which is an additional scoop of funding for each kid, kicks in at 55%, and we are currently at? Um, our district is 52%. 52%. So there is a great um, impetus for us to make sure that we've identified as many families as possible mm -hmm. because it's significantly fiscally better to be at 55 than to be at 52, 3, 4, where mm -hmm. we're close to that money, have basically those students and are not receiving that those additional fiscal resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this year you will see a push for free and reduced applications because if it, it comes, I think it's 47 kids, I did the math somewhere, um, additional families that would qualify and then we would be getting um, additional funds. I have to say this one area where I think the district has done a really good job mm -hmm. in, in the yes. iteratively over the past three, mm -hmm. four years, just every year, yep. done better and better at identifying and getting those kids yeah. on there. This is a nice segue for Julie, yes. isn't it? Yes. Um, because Julie does such a nice job at back to school nights. She always has a couple of employees at back to school night, both by, uh, who are bilingual, and um, in, and passing out those free and reduced lunch forms. So, Tiarza Taylor has a campaign to help us with that as well. Yeah. Okay, Julie. Thank you. Sorry for the tech uh, computer issues. Um, good evening. My name is Julie Chesson. I'm the Director of Nutrition Services, and I feel like I was just here presenting at the end of last school year, and I'm here again. Um, 
I'll be presenting with Lori Hammer from Food for Thought. Uh, a little bit later in the presentation, I'll introduce her. Uh, but I'm here tonight to, um, I'm very excited to share with you all of the changes that are occurring this year. Uh, we're really envisioning um, nutrition services as a whole. And so I want to share with you this evening all of the wonderful things that we're doing. And how do you advance? Is it on? Oh. Okay, so um, I'll be talking about how we're uh, doing our part in reducing our carbon footprint. Um, we've been looking at uh, looking at the plate as a whole and the food that we put on the plate and how that will affect the environment. Uh, I'll also be introducing some of our plant-based options that we're incorporating in our menus this year, as well as some program enhancements that will be offering. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so this summer I attended uh, a presentation, a training by Friends of the Earth. They're a nonprofit organization um, who supports food and agriculture programs by transitioning the food systems to sustainable, healthy, and just systems. And they they have a program that supports school districts, um, K-12, and to help us shift to more plant-forward, plant-based options, as well as sustainable and healthier foods. So um, during this training, it, it really impacted me regarding our beef and our beef purchases. And so one of the topics that they discussed was beef and how that affects our environment with the carbon dioxide that is produced um, from produce, uh, processing beef. And last year we purchased about 4,500 pounds of beef, which equals 28,000 servings. And if we were to transition our, from purchasing beef products to plant-based products, uh, we would be saving 145,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. Um, these calculations were done by uh, Friends of the Earth, and the calculations were based off transitioning from beef to um, garbanzo bean products, and that's not really realistic of what we are doing. We are introducing more plant-based items, but we're also gonna be incorporating poultry as well to replace the, the beef products. So they can then uh, provide more um, accurate data at the end of the school year for us when they do a menu comparison. Can I ask what the, why the decision was made to go with poultry instead of plant-based? Um, okay. I'm sorry? Is that it's an iterative process, right? So yeah. in but other districts just, where they've gone entirely plant-based, uh, it doesn't go so well for students, and so it's kind of providing additional options um, mm -hmm. that still allows students to have meat-based choices, and so, but also incorporating plant-based choices. So, yeah. Uh, so that in the entirely plant-based districts that go from zero to 100, um, they yeah, generally a lose kids. a lot of money. Well, and a lot healthy. of those school districts tend to move from a processed product to another processed product that's plant-based. And um, I'm really wanting to transition to a more scratch cooking model. Yeah. So um, we're so going to we have to do a lot of experimenting. <laughs> I'm sorry? So we need our own cows. Yeah. That would be wonderful. <laughs> but you're not are you talking about eliminating beef or just reducing beef? No, ne this next year I'm planning on eliminating beef. Mm -hmm. So if we were to replace our beef with only plant-based, we would be saving about, um, what does that say, 161,000 miles driven by the average passenger vehicle. And another example is uh, the carbon emissions from 7,400 gallons of gasoline. And that's just with this one change that we're doing. I, I only know anecdotally, but what kind of studies have been done, do you know, on reducing the amount of protein in children's diets? Um, 
Well, we're not actually, we're not reducing the amount of protein. We're replacing the protein from an animal product to a plant-based product. We're so it's a, right. So, we're, so, so it's an additional product. kinds of protein, but it's not taking away the protein. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you advance? Because there's still advanced? federal guidelines for it. Right. It's not well, working There's enough. a lot of, of studies that say we eat too much protein, but that's not really <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I just... I know family relatives I've had who took children in in Central America. They fed them a U.S. diet, and they were like a third taller than all their mm -hmm. siblings. So I I don't know. I just that's why I say I only know anecdotally. Mm -hmm. um, so another way that we're reducing our carbon footprint, we're eliminating styrofoam, and these were all of the styrofoam products that we were purchasing last year. Um, it is a phasing out process. We still have styrofoam within the district, so if you do see it, that's why. We're not purchasing any new styrofoam. It's just what we have already have in our inventory. Um, the table on the bottom is an example of replacing a styrofoam cup with a compostable cup. And as you can see, it's, uh, the cost is an increase of five cents per unit. So there is an additional cost to um, transition, transitioning to compostable items and Food for Thought has helped us in the past and currently um, with our five compartment trays. Uh, they helped us to eliminate the, the styrofoam five compartment tray and we're using a compostable tray and um, they contribute $3,000 a year and that's the difference in cost. I don't want to just always be the naysayer, but I, mm -hmm. I just read an article about Chipotle's compostable bowls. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, I just want to make sure we don't have those same carcinogens in our compostable bowls and trays. Okay, yeah. If you can check on that. Yes, I will check on that. What was it, Chipotle? Yeah, I'll follow up with you, Julie. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're also Not that they don't. Get, I mean, they get enough bad press, right? But <laughs> <laughs> we're also eliminating the the sport kit, so we'll no longer have the straw and the packaging to deal with. Um, we're going to be replacing it with the fork, spoon, and knife and napkin dispensers. Um, and I'm also trying to eliminate the straws on packaging, such as the juice boxes. Uh, we did remove that juice box for a la carte purchases, but the challenge that I have is um, providing a shelf-stable juice box that doesn't have a straw for our elementary students. So, oh, it's working. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so here's some examples of our plant-based options we're incorporating. And I just wanna talk briefly about the bento boxes that we're gonna be doing. Uh, so it will be a reimbursable meal. It will have four meal components, the protein, which is plant-based, the vegetable, the fruit, and a grain. And then students will have the option to choose whether or not they want the milk. So um, originally I was thinking we would have these bento boxes only at the high school and the middle school, but then um, Food for Thought had suggested to also bring it into the, to the elementaries because she said her Shannon, <laughs> um, her children would love a bento box at the elementary level, so we, <laughs> so we will try them. I've hmm? heard you mention juice, and I've heard you mention milk. Do we offer water, not in plastic bottles? Um, the the refilling stations. We have the refilling mm -hmm. stations, but if you're going through the lunch line, your options are juice or milk. Yes, and. Water um, is not a requirement of the USDA meals program, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Yeah, right. <laughs> it doesn't count as one of the it's not a meal component. <laughs> so you'll find mm -hmm. that in our work, in our striving to do this work, uh, our our battle is often with uh, the the USDA and some of the state and federal guidelines around uh, what they reimburse, what's allowable, the cost of, you know, they only provide milk, they don't provide plant-based milk options. So there's a lot of things that, um, 
you know, are areas that we're running into saying, oh, this mm -hmm. is, you know, we have limited choices, mm -hmm. not because we want to provide limited options, but because we, they are given to us that way. Because mm -hmm. we aren't as good as the milk lobby. Got it. Yeah. Yes. And okay. actually, um, <coughs> I was looking into offering, uh, like, soy milk, a soy milk option. And unfortunately, the we can't. We can only provide soy milk to, to families who uh, complete a medical statement for meal accommodation. So I contacted the state regarding that. And that is an area so a, that... a doctor's note for that? Can we all just say we need That is an area that Friends of the Earth is um, uh, supporting us on. So they're talking to the state about plant-based uh, beverages. But also, you know, water in, in the box. Yeah. That's what of, I was thinking. Yeah, yeah not water plastic, bottles, yeah. but the boxes of water, yeah. We're also going to be making some homemade fruit and vegetable smoothies at the high school. Um, and Food for Thought is also per, um, supporting us with purchasing a Vitamix for this um, addition. And I'm also looking at no blend smoothies at the elementary level, which would be, um, uh, it'll be a mix of yogurt, applesauce, and orange juice. So um, here's a list of some meat alternative proteins that, that the USDA uh, does recognize as a protein. Um, so the ones that are bold, the legumes, lentils, and the peanut butter, I can get those at a reduced cost through the USDA foods. All the other protein alternatives, um, I would have to purchase at a commercial price. And then, of course, we're looking at ad adding additional ingredients, such as quinoa and flaxseed and chia seed into our recipes. So, so as you can see, this transition is a little bit more costly, so we are looking at ways that we can uh, supplement the cost of these items. And so we did increase our lunch prices by 25 cents, um, and we also looked at our a la carte prices. So some program enhancements, we are, have increased, we are increasing our points of sale at both Matillaha and Nordoff. Right now at Matillaha, we have two points of sale and that will increase to four points of sale. And we're currently in the process of hiring two nutrition services workers. And then at Nordoff, we're increasing from six points of sale to eight points of sale. Um, and we're currently recruiting student workers for those positions. And uh, when talking with other school districts in the area, increasing the number of points of sale also increases sales, which again will help us supplement for the increased cost. And that, that's a picture of, of what the cart looks like. So we have a blue and a red one. Um, and so on one cart, we can feed up to 200 students. We're also bringing in these vending machines. We contracted with um, Insta Healthy vending machines and they're gonna be stocking these machines with smart snack compliant items, um, such as granola bars, pop chips, uh, juices, um, sparkling waters, and so we have one machine at both Nordoff and Matillaha, and actually I contacted them this evening about um, bringing in another machine for the uh, staff lounge at Nordoff. And we don't have to service these machines, the, the company will do it for us, uh, we just make a commission off of, of them, so this is another way we can supplement as well. So now I'd like to introduce Lori, and she can further discuss our program can I enhancements. Ask one more question. I know oh, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm the prude up here about food, but I'm curious about the. You said no blended smoothies at the mm -hmm. elementary level, and I'm curious about the yogurt because you said juice and applesauce, and I'm just thinking of the sugar content. Mm -hmm. um, is it is it no sweet unsweetened yogurt? Or yeah. Really pumping the kids full of sugar. No, it would. We're, I am looking at added sugar as well as okay. we're doing recipe development. And that's one of the trainings I wanted to provide to my team is about carbohydrates and simple versus complex. 
And um, so I'm, I'm definitely um, considering the sugar content when developing recipes. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Um, it, not yes. usually, but go ahead. Um, my main concern was the vending machine that you just showed, um, because I saw a lot of single-use plastic bottles in it yeah. and cans, and we're transitioning away from that. In fact, the city's even looking at reinforcing an ordinance that hasn't been reinforced regarding that. So I would just think about that because it's if we're gonna. If you're going to focus on, on reducing our carbon footprint, um, having a vending machine with those types of items is kind of the antithesis. And there's just, not a ton of options available, but as they become available, so boxes of things instead of plastic, absolutely that's part of the, the long-term stocking plan. Can I comment, please? Sure. Uh, now, when it, when it comes to the National School Lunch Program, are you going to be hiring another nutrition worker for that line? Because that line here in Ojai is pretty infamous for not allowing a lot of the smaller children under five feet tall to get in there and get their lunch. So the USDA National School Lunch Program provides meals to students who are in K-12. There is another program under the USDA um, called Child and Adult Care Food Program, and that's for, for children who are zero through five. Okay, but my question is, are you going to be hiring another nutrition worker for the kids who just go up to get their regular lunch? We just yeah. covered that in the previous yeah, slide. Yeah, comments uh, are fine, but we need to move on with the presentation. It's all the same. They're all in the same line. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm just gonna jump in here. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Um, I have this little notebook here that says school food. It's just my little school food, and that starts, it's one of many, but it starts with February 10th, 2017, and and it has like bento boxes, you know? So so here it is, relentless incrementalism, which is just kind of uh, what I seem to be going for with, um, with food for thought and working with the school district and little by little and uh, it's it's been wonderful to work with Julie and also attend the community uh, engaged to impact events and and see just how how relentless incrementalism can can get us there um, as part of my job with executive director of food for thought I am the co-chair of a steering committee for Ventura County Farm to School Collaborative. And that is a collaborative that Ojai Unified has been a part of since 2012 with Suzanne uh, Lutoff, Julie's pre predecessor. And that organization received a USDA grant that was a planning grant about how to work together to identify local growers to create a harvest of the month um, menu and and help purchase it together and and get it out to our local schools and uh, over the next three years they really identified some big goals but again it was a planning grant as those things are and then we got a, an implementation grant in 2015 and that ran for two years and that was a, a CDFA grant and we really worked on nutrition education and uh, making some farmer videos and getting a website uh, actually we didn't quite get a website that was that was next and then those grants uh, kind of phased out and we got a grant from Kaiser Permanente that's a three-year grant we're on the last year this year and that was the one we built the website with and um, the second part of that was a uh, nutrition, nutrition specialist training teachers to do in-class lessons around Harvest of the Month. And now we have just received a new farm, uh, USDA Farm to School grant. And this is really exciting. Like, this is exciting news. Um, the, uh, it's the same seven districts who work together. So this cohort of nutrition services directors, which Julie has been a part of since she was with Oxnard uh, Elementary, uh, you know, really is able to work together to create some common goals 
and their common goal for this next couple years is to subcontract with the Center for Good Food Purchasing, which is, I know there's, you know, you get into like alphabet soup and like who are all these organizations, but the Center for Good Food Purchasing works with public entities, New York City, LA Unified, LA Public Health, um, to help identify first to take all their purchasing, food purchasing information, and then see how it lines up with core values, such as supporting your local economy and environmental sustainability. What products are you purchasing that support environmental sustainability? How do your products line up with a valued workforce? Are the companies you, are, you are buying from um, paying a, a living wage, taking care of their workers? Uh, animal welfare is at the fourth uh, the fourth value, are you buying uh, from farmers and producers and processors that are treating animals well? And the last one is uh, nutrition. And so it looks at, it will look at every district, those seven districts, each line item for what they buy. It'll sc to scrub all the data. It will issue a report. And then the districts together have decided that they want to increase their local procurement by 15% as a group and what that does for a small district like us that we are able to be kind of a part of a bigger purchasing really scaling up uh, purchasing at, by participating with joint procurement and um, what it can also eventually do for us is to help identify you know how many environmentally sound products are we buying is this a goal that we want to continue Maybe we're at 10% now, maybe two years from now, we want to be at 25%. Each district is going to be able to kind of set their own goals based on the information that they get and through the Center for Good Food Purchasing, which is going to be paid for by the grant. So that's really exciting news. The woman who's the head of, who will be working with, with each of our districts, her name is Vanessa Zeifen, and she is a new resident to Ojai. And she has two young kids who will be starting our school in the next couple of years. So uh, you might be seeing her on campuses uh, in the next couple of years, but she's definitely going to be working closely with all of these districts. And um, I'm really proud to be a part of like a county uh, community, a, a county collaborative which is also benefiting our community so uh, so specifically. And um, uh, just were there any other? With, oh, I have another slide. And then uh, we're working again back to those Harvest of the Month campaigns. This is like a work in progress with some of our new uh, graphics that we've been working with. This has been designed by Shannon Hall, who is the program coordinator, and she's a parent extraordinaire. And um, <laughs> She's been working with, yeah, she can stand here. Um, anyway, she's been working with our, our team on, on looking at um, a campaign idea. And one of these, I, we, we have this idea for kind of these Harvest of the Month posters and then also featuring maybe some popular members of Ojai School District, like some of our librarians, to kind of help with the, some of the definitions like hydrated, you know, to like help spotlight like a vocabulary word or something and what does hydrated mean or what is your immune system or what do we mean say when we say something's good for your your gut or something, what does, what does that mean? Just kind of giving some nutrition facts while promoting our local, uh, local harvest of the month and also facts like when do you plant it, when do you harvest it. Um, so we're just, we're really looking forward to rolling that out. The goal is that we don't necessarily have to have um, the beef and milk campaign posters in all yes. of our schools uh, just because they are free to us. I mean, we all love Michael Jordan's Got yeah. Milk, but right. you know, we can update some things around here. So. so, anyway, are there any questions before I turn it back over to you? Thank you all very much. Thank Thanks, you. Sorry. Okay, well, that completes the presentation. Do you have any questions? Thank you for all of that work. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you, Tiffany, for your support with all of this, and um, we really want to mirror the, the values and belief of the Ojai community, and I think we're moving in that direction, so. Yeah, I always love the presentations, always new and interesting stuff. So.
and I and Lori, I um, I was on the board of Food for Thought many years ago when all this seemed impossible. So it, it's the incrementalism is <laughs> right on. Except right now it doesn't feel like increments. <laughs> it's a little speedy. So. <laughs> Julie, I do have one question. You mentioned that your goal was to increase the percentage of scratch field meals. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Oh, we do quite a bit. I can't give you a percentage. Um, I would say I do have some of my, my team here back here. Lorraine is um, a chef, and we have Linda. She's the kitchen manager over at Minos Oaks. Uh, I, we try and do maybe like a scratch-cooked item with a processed item every day, so like a hamburger with um, something homemade, like vegetarian chili. Um, so... I wouldn't say it's at quite 50%, maybe a little bit less than that. We're working on it. Yeah, <laughs> we're working on it, and they're working very hard, too. And the, so. the having a central kitchen model mm -hmm. will facilitate that. So for now, okay. we're doing the best we can, but eventually our major structural facilities changes will be designed to help implement that, that goal of scratch food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're doing, they do a lot of scratch, scratch cooking at Topa now. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thanks a lot. Have a wonderful yeah. evening. All right. And with that, we'll move on to Matilaha. So while we're, we're introducing this, I'll say, uh, just as Julie was just here, Matilaha was just here. Um, but there were enough questions about the transition and the, the transition to middle school from junior high is uh, on everyone's mind. So what we presented in uh, May or June, I don't know, one of those months when I wasn't here working, but was here, uh, was, was we just want to make sure that any, we've been moved, we're doing a lot of work over the summer and we want to make sure that everyone's up to speed and knows that we are ready for kids on Wednesday. Yes. And if you think you're here a lot, imagine us. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, we've been asked a lot, a lot. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? And our response has always been, I'll get back to you in five days. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll know if we were ready or not. <clears throat> so we are extremely excited about this change. As you guys all know, we have a lot of things happening. A lot of preparation, long hours right now, getting ready. A lot of teachers uh, on our staff. It's incredible when I was looking at the roster of the teachers. Yeah. We have, we went from 16 to like 25, something like that. New staff members. So the difference is about 10, 10 brand new teachers that we're gonna have on staff. So that is super excited because every single one of them is, is, is full of positive energy and is ready for the year to start. And they can wait. Uh, we have obviously implemented the big change in our schedule, which is the advisory period, where we're gonna be doing the second step for the SEL curriculum that we're gonna be um, implementing this year, as well as a big shift on the way we deal with discipline. Um, it doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden gonna get rid of detentions. We're still gonna have detentions there, but it's not gonna be the, the go-to discipline. We're gonna do this restorative justice approach that Carol is the master at, mm -hmm. she can talk all about it. Um, so we can't wait about those changes. I think um, it's all gonna be super excited. This is the schedule, this is what it's gonna look like. You, as you guys know, we talked about advisory that's gonna happen right at the end of fourth period, right in between uh, fourth and lunch. Is it gonna be the 20, it's gonna be the 20 minute uh, length period of time. And I wanna tell you something that the advisory, believe it or not, has really opened up the, a lot of opportunities for us. Um, a quick example is we used to have our pride assembly, what we call the pride assembly, where we would bring the seventh graders to the auditorium and spend a period talking about expectations, and then we would bring the eighth graders next. And that happened the first week of school. Well, what we decided to do is, wait a minute, we have the advisory now. It's gonna be a lot more powerful, it's gonna be a lot more meaningful. Instead of talking to you know, 180 kids in the auditorium, to talk to a group of 20 kids. But then there's only two of us, right? So what we decided to do over the summer is uh, we created some videos and we broke down the Pride Assembly into the categories that we thought would be meaningful to the students. So we talked about bullying, right? That's one category. Talked about boundaries, that's another category. 
And anyways, we have five different categories that are going to be presented during the advisory about the expectation that we're going to have at Matilda Middle School. And yes, it's me talking. And I recorded myself over the summer. And it's very <laughs> difficult because the first time I've ever done video, and I'm, my personality doesn't fall into that category, but I think I did OK. So if you guys want to check out the videos, I'm going to send them to you, but don't post them. Aren't they on YouTube? I got one on my channel, the oh, one okay. that I share with you, just so you can use some feedback. I want to add something about advisory. When all of it played out and the classes were formed, we are very, very lucky and proud to say that there's only 20 students for a teacher in oh, each on advisory. Average, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think one class has 21 mm -hmm. and all the others have 20. And Carol and I have an advisory. And we have one. So that's the perfect opportunity for us to go back into the classroom setting a little bit. And we're going to be switching. You know, she'll take the first week, I'll take the second week, and so forth and so on. Um, yeah. Wednesday schedule will still remain the same. We will not, we're not going to have the advisor on Wednesday. The advisor will be on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Javier, yes. are you still doing tutorial? We're not doing no. tutorial enrichment anymore, okay. but we're doing some of the things that we did during the tutorial. We're going to try to incorporate them in the advisory. Oh, okay. Okay, because the, uh, the idea is that the advisory is four days a week. The, the teachers are going to have a lesson to do a week once we start second step. Mm -hmm. The first week is all going to be uh, expectations and, Javier and, and me. Javier <laughs> Life, yeah. The show, the Javi show. Uh, but as you know, starting the second week, we're going to go and dig into second step. And uh, they're going to take two days to do the lesson. And they're going to have Thursday and Friday to do additional things with their kids. Mm. And that's what we're thinking about maybe incorporating some of the things that we did with advisory during that Thursday and Friday. We're also introducing, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but we're going to do class competitions on Fridays. Uh, friendly competitions, all right, between classes and, um, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, during the advisory. Oh, during the advisory. Yeah, and we're going to keep oh. brackets and we're going to post them and it's going to be my class versus Mrs. Vorchak's class, for example, on, I don't know, cup stacking, for example, you know, some kind of a competition like that to make it, uh, to bring back that, that school spirit. Um, so. And have that advisory group feel like a team. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the first activity that I have, because on my lessons that I did, it's me talking about expectations and things like that, but I try to incorporate an activity within that lesson with an advisory. So the first activity that I have for the first day is for the class to pick a mascot. So each class is going to have their own little mascot, and that's how we're going to do uh, the brackets, and we're going to be competing against each other. Which is interesting when you think about when the tutorials were introduced, it was trying to bring those students who were just missing that, you know, that uh, sort of meeting the expectations and bringing them up. But um, you know, all the research shows that engagement does engagement, the same thing. Yeah, so like they might belong. not have that one-on-one -on -one time yeah. with the teacher mm -hmm. specifically about a math problem, but maybe being in, able to engage more with a teacher kind of helps that. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, that that is it. That's the that's at the heart. That's what we're trying to do to have that connect that 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 personal connection with each one of those students. That's why mm -hmm. we decided to really try to minimize the, the number of kids in the class. Uh, so I think that's going to help tremendously. So here's uh, our, our map, and there's a track right there. And as you guys are all probably aware already, that that's sort of the, we're going to call the sixth grade uh, wing, because that's where most of the sixth graders are going to be in for their core classes. Although that we, we speculate that they're probably going to be hanging out around that area during recess. You know, it's not going to be exclusive to them, but that's probably where most of them will hang out. The campus is an open campus, so they, they can hang out anywhere they want. Uh, but just because of the boundaries that are already established there and the fact that their classroom is there, they're probably going to be hanging out all around that area. Okay. There's our newly developed uh, logo for Matuloha Middle School. Okay. I was trying to convince Tiffany to put a picture of uh, Carol and I right in the front <laughs> but that didn't go too far. That's, that's our new logo. I love it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just super exciting. You know, new school, it's, it's a historic moment for the staff. And that's really how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up my first staff meeting. You know, I have, I have, I've kept some documentation about Matilha and the history of the Ojai Unified. And I'm going to put this date up there. I mean, there, there's one more benchmark. You know, the fact that Matilha Junior High is now becoming a, a middle school. Uh, we're on Wednesday. The idea is that we're going to, um, we're going to, it's going to be a huge party. You guys are invited to Matilha. Oh, yeah. Wednesday. Wednesday. We start, we start school on Wednesday. We want you guys. Uh, Please come. You're more than welcome. Uh, the, you know, we have T-shirts, Matilha Middle School T-shirts. We're going to encourage our, our staff to wear it on Wednesday morning, be out there welcoming the kids. 
Uh, during lunch, we're going to have. You guys want a T-shirt? Uh, yes. All right. What time is the party? <laughs> we we're going to have it at lunch, 11:45. Uh, 11:45. 11 11 so it's on a Wednesday, right. and we're going to have a DJ playing music. We're going to have a couple of tables out there, uh, encouraging kids to sign up for sports. Also encouraging kids to Wednesday. sign up for a club. It's Wednesday, the first, first day of school. school. First day of school. Yeah. Um, next slide, Javier, that talks about the first day of school. Okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, the this organization is, that, is going to be on Friday. Friday. You guys are also invited this Friday. We're going to have our. Uh, Orientation for incoming seven and incoming six great families as well. That's, that's the day where they get to pick up their schedule. So every, everybody's super excited and they can't wait to see who they got. Uh, and we're also going to be offering for the first time since I've been there, we're going to make it again a festivity. We're going to be offering food. So we have uh, Don Lalo's coming over uh, to serve tacos. And then we're also have, we're going to have tamales as well. And our wonderful PTO is overseeing that. And, um, they're very motivated and we have an amazing PTO. Um, we're very motivated and they want to be part of this uh, historic moment. Um, so we're super excited and we're trying to get as many families as we can possibly have. Oh, so there's a... First day of school. The first day of school, so DJ. Um, and what we're thinking about doing is, since it's the first, first, do this during the first three days, so Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, is to allow our sixth grade class in our seventh grade class to take recess maybe a few minutes earlier. Um, that way, you know, so hopefully it'll lower their anxiety level. They're waiting for the bell to ring and they don't know what's gonna happen, right? Eighth graders are out there, seventh graders are out there, sixth graders are out there. So I think what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to have them go out a few minutes earlier uh, to, to lunch so they can go ahead and line up in the lunch line. Um, and same thing with the seventh grade class. Yep. So that's, that'll be the first time we've ever done something like that. Um, and I think that's just gonna help them out, at least with their anxiety level. The we don't feel so great. Uh, yeah, we thought we talked about that. So, yeah, we're we're going to get some Please. complaints from the agents. Sure. They're like, all the tables are going to be gone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, additional supervision we're going to have during, again, during snack and recess, especially the first couple of weeks, we're going to try to get an extra body out there to help us out with this. Uh, supervision is going to be crucial, it's going to be critical, and we're going to make sure that we re emphasize to our supervisors the importance of making sure that they're out there connecting with kids. Um, who, who's DJ gonna do, who does the supervision? Well, typically we have uh, teachers there. We know are going to come back this year. They're going to do it. Um, we're working with Barbie right now to find out who else can do it. But on our first day on Monday, we'll ask if anybody wants to go ahead and sign up for supervision. And typically, we haven't had an issue filling those roles out. Um, so right now, like for example, right now it will be Carol and I, obviously, and then we have Mr. Topping coming back, so he's and probably going to do it. And Mrs. Holden now. And then we have Ms. Holden now, uh, up in the office, 20% mm -hmm. as, like, as a counselor. Um, and, then, um, and then we also have uh, Chantal coming back, and Taylor. So right off the bat, we have like six people to do supervision. Because I, I mean, I will, as a school board member, I know we, we promised that there would be extra supervision. Mm -hmm. So I want to yeah. make sure we're going to hold that up. Absolutely. Oh, you're going to be there, aren't you? Right. Yeah. Have you signed so up? we're counting on you. Have you signed up for the 2 o'clock shift, Kevin? <laughs> I've got a golf cart and a security guard in the uh, outfit. <laughs> What's fault? <laughs> so some of the additional programs that this change has brought up is uh, the electives. As you know, uh, we just have a huge array of electives now. Aerospace seems to be one of the most popular ones. And coding. Uh, and coding. Aerospace and coding. But you can see the variety uh, of our offerings is humongous, it's big. It's more than I ever thought we were gonna be able to ever offer at Matilha. And remember, we're switching six, our sixth graders with PE. They're gonna alternate on a weekly basis, so that allowed us to offer yet one more additional elective for them. Javier? Yes. That's CTE pathway, the CTE pathway, healthcare and video production, is that combined or are those two separate? No, pathways? it's combined. Amber Monaris uh, is the one that's doing it. She'll do a half a year. Mm -hmm. It's a They're year not at the same time. Oh, she's, right. yeah. she's, okay. They're combined as in she is the same teacher. The same but, teacher, right. but, not, but not the same yeah. time. Yeah. 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 No. It's right. not taking yeah. videos. They videotape while they're doing CPR. <laughs> 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 there it is. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> can we skip that one? Yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you're here. Oh. <laughs> you were here. Sorry. My bad. My bad. <laughs> a lot of construction is going on. You can see it from the avenue. You can see it from El Paseo. Uh, it's great. We're, our facilities are going to look amazing. 
Uh, we're backed up a little bit on the gym project, uh, the locker room actually, the locker room specifically, but it's okay because we already established a system in place before school ended as far as getting kids dressed up and getting kids ready for PE uh, using the gym and using the fitness center. So even though the locker room is gonna take longer than we expected, um, it's still gonna be functional. We're gonna be able to function there uh, with that. It's scheduled to finish sometime in October and then um, you know, the cafeteria, it's gonna be huge and hopefully everything gets approved and everything gets going the way it's supposed to go. Uh, and that could potentially start as early as, as, as this year. Uh, that's, that's in the plan, as early as November. And I'm scared and excited at the same time because yeah. that cafeteria is going to be huge. It's going to be huge, huge, because that's sort of our central place during recess. But and just to be clear, that project really, is what, a 280-day project, something like that? So there's no way to just do that in the summer. Mm -hmm. It will have to mm -hmm. cross school years. And so given the nutrition services that we just heard about, the positive impact to our programs, we decided to, to if it's gonna cross school years, we might as well do it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So how, what is, is there hopefully an institutional way that we're making sure that the construction sites are completely cordoned off, that people, yeah. are, you know. Mm -hmm. we, That's why we have our We devote two human beings to standing in the road with a stop mm -hmm. sign, hopefully we're gonna have something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just did a sidewalk, uh, I don't know, sometime this week, mm -hmm. and we walked around and looked at the fencing and we're looking at that stuff. So. Yeah, that's something that we're going to have to look at very closely. Yeah, I mean, I would think maybe at, at recesses and breaks when kids are milling yeah. around that you'd mm -hmm. want to have some human being saying, mm -hmm. like... Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Javier, when I was in middle school, they were enclosing the center of an outdoor campus and we had to walk around the buildings, and this was in the snow of Missouri, so it's not going to so be So it's not like that bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> Look how Jane came out. I know, yeah, she's <laughs> okay. I survived. Uh, that's, I believe, that's it. And well, you guys are welcome to join us on Friday afternoon or Wednesday, first day of school, to be part of the team. And I'll actually say we just did our site walk. We're on every site. We're doing a... Um, to ensure that the frontage of the schools are is as great as it can possibly be for the return of students. And so we are um, having some stenciling about where the office is painted. We're moving some blood. We're, we're doing a, a few nice, things nice to make sure to um, that the space looks really nice when students and staff. I do have to say there. the t-shirt parking lot behind the outer term looks great. Yeah, it looks yeah. fabulous. It looks amazing now. Uh, on my summer letter to our staff, I said, you're not going to have to worry about swimming in those puddles back there when it rains. Because <laughs> that's literally what they were doing, swimming those battles. So it, it, was, it was great. Nice job on that. Any questions? Anything else? Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be fabulous. It really is. I hope you guys will come and stay. You guys should have come up and said, now we heard a rumor of the sixth grade's coming? <laughs> <laughs> what? Is that happening this year or next year? <laughs> all right, thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. All right. Uh, moving on to uh, 7.1.1. Does the Committee on Assignments and Action as requested uh, to approve the uh, committee's recommendation and staff assignments. So based on what you just heard, uh, we have some additional elective options. The committee on assignments gets together and determines essentially if teachers are credentialed to teach an elective subject in a departmentalized classroom that's not within their authorization. So, um, you know, in a, in a middle school, we're not going to have a, a coding teacher we're not going to have someone with an aerospace credential, um, probably, who would be teaching middle school. And so this committee gets together and says, we recommend that these three teachers, and we, we ensure that they're qualified to teach these three middle school electives. And we've done this before. Yeah. On other right. Yep. So. Yeah. yeah right. I didn't know all, yeah. Like, uh, Kate's a pilot, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so she's yeah. Pilot. The credentialing process is, I, we actually have a number of pilots who do not qualify for a credential in... Um, in aviation because of the hour requirement. So the hour requirement for a teaching credential is actually much higher than the hour requirement to be a pilot, yeah. just as a side note. So, uh, yeah, this is good. I'll move to approve, is there a conversation? Or yeah, no, that's good. Yes, All, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, that's unanimous. 
Uh, 7.3.1, adoption of K through 8 English language power. Who doesn't want power? <laughs> <laughs> language power. Um, as a result of the FPM, we're still, there's still a bit of residue from the FPM, Federal Program Monitoring. And one was our ELD curriculum didn't meet the state guidelines for an ELD curriculum. We were using at Matillaha something called um, language, exclamation point, and it was an intensive reading intervention program. So the auditor pointed that out and said that we had to have a true ELD program that was completely aligned with the ELD standards in the um, domains of speaking, listening, writing, and reading. And so we found a program and, well, we actually looked at several programs. <coughs> and some were just, we talked to principals, we talked to ELD teachers, and I even asked a couple of EL students who I had had a long time ago to look at it. And um, so we narrowed it down to this language power and we think it will work really well because within each kit, and you can see it's a kit, within each kit, the reading level might go from a 1.1 to a 3.3 in the K2 band. So it has a lot more flexibility, and that's especially good for our district because our, we don't have very many English learners, and so in one group you have a wide range and you have to be able to differentiate. So I think for that reason it's a good program. And um, Can I ask where, like, sure. I mean, how, how did you find, because I, I went and looked at the program today, and I, I was looking at the 6 through 8 one. Right. And it just felt like the same, all the stuff we were just talking about in the vision, that it's not that, that it was just sort of this, I mean, it, you know, it's not about Very things scripted. that, it's just not about things that seventh graders are, you know, it's gonna, it's about, you know, nurses and, I don't know, it just felt so dry and it you felt mean, very babyish. Were you I mean, I know their reading level is low, but that doesn't yeah. mean their mental capacity is low. Mm -hmm. And if you treat them like babies, <clears> I, don't, <throat> I don't think they're going to be inspired to read. I mean, it should be a story about you know, mountain climbers and... Right. I don't know. It just... Well... Was there anything out there that was a little bit more... There were other programs, but most of the other programs were way too... Mm -hmm. You'd have to have a whole group of one level to really be able to teach it well. And... There were way too many words on a page, for example. In fact, when Cheryl and I looked at one, I mean, there were just way too many words on a page. It would be overwhelming. And this program has those leveled readers that you're talking about on different topics, and they do advertise that they are good for the middle schooler, or then the other band is K2, and then the um, the the other band is three five. So the kits come in a K two band, a three five band, and a six eight. So it's just and to kind of echo your <clears throat> point, even though there's other programs out there, I don't know that I've ever seen any EL yeah. programs that speak to what you're talking about. It, it's but a problem will, across the board. Yeah, right. but I will say it's a language acquisition difference because when I, I was a Spanish teacher, so when you teach Spanish one, for example you're really trying to expose them to a lot of vocabulary in a theme, right? And so, like, when I would teach, like, the family unit and you'd be learning how to say mother and father and sister and brother and then you're doing sentences that are around that family, I'm telling you, ninth graders don't think it's super fun. You know, like, it's not like you can ask and talk about a lot of really interesting topics like philosophy when you're learning first year Spanish, right? And that's kind of what these programs are geared to. They're just really trying to expose kids to thematic vocabulary, sentence structures, and so it's not really exciting because they don't have enough language in English to talk about exciting subject matters. But you have to remember, these are meant to be like 35 minutes of their day. They're still sitting in English classes. They're still sitting in science classes. They're still sitting in history classes, and that's where we're hoping that they're still going to be exposed to that rich discussion and have opportunities for that other sort of engaging, meaningful type of stuff. Okay. And what are the costs on, on this? They're um, $4.99 per kit, and so we decided that 
In the past, we've been using usually Journeys, the ELD component of Journeys, and it, it hasn't been well articulated from school to school, and especially from elementary school to Matilaha. So since we were going to purchase something for Matilaha anyway, we decided let's articulate that whole K-8 program so that it doesn't matter where a student goes to school, they're all getting the same program. So is but per kit does that mean per student? Or no. Kit is one class? kit one kit serves the K to two students. So if you buy one kit, um, it's the teacher's kit. Okay. And then it has the these But we would need we one need per site. Eight kits. Oh that's per site I was thinking. Well, mm -hmm. A teacher at Minor Zones with the K two kit isn't gonna share it with right. the Miramani teacher or the total. Right. We need eight total. Oh there it is. Sorry. K eight, so I thought it was Per grade. Yeah, they come in bands. Got it. K two, three, five, and six Got eight. It. So in a way we don't really have a choice because we're being I required. I don't think so. By, I mean there just yeah. isn't a lot of a lot of variety in ELD because it that's what it is. It's a language acquisition program. Sounds like we could pick something worse. <laughs> yes. And so we do have yeah. choices. It is pretty expensive. I mean, five hundred dollars. That's very typical. And what does it consist? What does the kit consist of? Um, There's one in the back. Oh, if you want 30, Thirty leveled readers that are also on audio. Um, practice book, teacher's guide, the audio, parent tip cards, and digital resources. Oh, yeah. It's not out of line yeah, with the cost of comparable materials. That's the 6-8. So, you know, this strikes me as something that may be apropos of the next agenda, item, actually, um, as an area that might benefit from software. Um, you know, I'm, right now, you, there's all these apps, right, Babel and I don't know, there's another one I'm learning mm -hmm. Gaelic with, but I'm not learning Gaelic. But, um, <laughs> It, it, it seems like that might be a is there some way to supplement this. I mean, it, there's a lot. It seems like there's a lot out there, and this seems a, like a very traditional approach. That is a very traditional approach, and I think there probably is a lot out there, and, and ELD teachers could do that, but we have to keep in mind they really only have ELD about 35 minutes a day. Right. And so I like the fact that there are parent resources because that's one way you can supplement and we're also talking about um, using our title three money to purchase um, uh, laptops for EL students mm. starting in maybe fourth grade and up this year and then maybe next year with the next allocation the younger kids. So that's a, the, what you're asking about, actually. Cheryl and I have, I was laughing because Cheryl and I have had many conversations where she says, we need this thing. And I say, where is the supplemental software that goes with this? Because reading, learning from a book is just not matching necessarily the modalities of how our kids, now not to say we shouldn't have books, but to say that there has to be this blended model. Um, and we, in fact, we're talking about it for, for Spanish, and I was having that exact same conversation. So this is where we are at this moment okay. because there are other big structural issues that we have to address, including having enough laptops. We just got enough bandwidth um, at our sites. We just upped, it, upped the Internet at our sites. But, but that's somewhere in a future It generation. is absolutely, for everything that we do, part of the consideration that we're including the modalities in which students learn in 2019, 20, and beyond in the, the purchases that we make with regards to curriculum. Great, thank you. And then in terms of this, Marilyn, I assume <laughs> that there's been success models. I mean, they have, right, when they sell you something, they said the school district has been using it and seeing research yeah. based. It's like, for example, San Diego Unified uses it. So those that's one that I can think of off the top of my head that uses it successfully. The publisher also, it's not a big house publisher, if you know, do you have the key? It's over here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Teacher, it's teacher. We're keeping it safeguarded. <laughs> teacher Created Materials is the publisher. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just not a big HMH, McGraw-Hill. It's not like that. It's 
teacher created materials. So if that makes any difference. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there a motion to approve? Yeah, I just want to add. You know, I. It's funny because we're we've been having and you've been hearing us talk about the vision. You know, and Jane, that your point's well taken. I mean, just it's sort of mm -hmm. it, with these, uh, to coin Lori's term, incremental decisions. You know, we mm -hmm. build the blocks upon which our district is based, and if some of it is feels clunky and mm -hmm. uninspired, you know, but I understand at the same time that there are realities and schools about to start and there are limited sources of this material so mm -hmm. but I have to say it just so happens that we just had our retreat on this you know so <laughs> and I would say I am especially sensitive to ensuring that that this particular student population which I would was calling in our engaged impact our most vulnerable populations our MVPs that they have the best we can offer them right and so this is the best we have at this moment, but this is not the best that we can do for them holistically in the future. At this point in time, it's necessary for us to move forward. Mm -hmm. But it's not to say you get these materials that aren't relevant and interesting to you while everyone else gets you know, this meaningful and engaging curriculum. It's absolutely not where we want to go long term with this. Mm -hmm. It's to say this is a bridge for you to spend the time in the other classes in the meaningful and engaging and challenging uh, curriculum. So, To quote Argo, this is the best bad idea we have. <laughs> I don't know of a better program. Right. I just want to, I, I want to make sure, I don't think it's an awful program and I want to clarify that. It's kind of like when kids are really struggling with reading, we use programs like Linda Mood Bell or like the Sunday system, and they look like that. They're these little kits, and they have all of these little cards, and you're going one by one through skill sets. And so this is really about getting kids over a hump, right? It's this, it is very structured, it is very clunky, it's not this engaging, enriching activity, but kids have to get, kids who are in good ELD programs within two years will fly and then be able to leave a program like that and go function in their classroom. So. Um, it's mm -hmm. not just not the worst program. I mean, it's yes, we'd like to look for better, but it is actually a good program, and it is actually going to serve students in a really real way. And so, and that is what programs look like when you're talking about foundational skills. Sometimes, so yeah, it's it's not as awful as we might no. think it looks. No, it bridge. isn't. Yeah, it's a bridge. Exactly. No, I, I'm not saying it's awful yeah. at all. No, no, I know. Yeah, I, 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 I think I think sure that I, you, you you articulated really well. I mean, it's it's like yeah. it's not. Um, I think we, we get that. I mean, I, I, there are aspects of, of education that in the end of the day, there aren't that many options for certain kinds of, of uh, materials, so. Right. And I think our goal with our English learners is really to move them out of the designated ELD, which is where that's what they're getting. What that kid instruction, is. Instruction. Yeah. The designated ELD into the integrated ELD, where the classroom teacher, whether it be in a content level, like social studies, science, mathematics are, are um, teaching using strategies for all learners including your English learners and they're in an integrated program because they deserve to have rich discussion and rich content right. so and that's I have to, you know to argue you know. myself a little bit Bane, is to say that you know if you've ever taken a seventh grader and put them in a kindergarten classroom and how they love to read those lower level books there's a little bit of that too, of that confidence building, that sense of, well, this is too young for me, but at the same time, for somebody who has trouble understanding, to say, oh, it's, it's silly, but, and I'm getting all this information mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. so. And while we were talking, I was thinking about the program I used to teach my kids to read, and there was nothing inspiring about it. <laughs> I mean, it was just, you know. <laughs> but they learned to read. <laughs> right. So I'll move to approve the program. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Aye. Thank you very much, sure. Marilyn. Uh, moving on to online learning. I lost my PowerPoint, didn't I? I'll just give a little introduction and say uh, this was in the parking lot issues for quite some time. I saw, in fact, when Dana and I first met and had our initial meeting, you, you brought this up. Um, so I'm excited to bring this work that was actually already in place before I got here, um, but to bring it to you to, to show you where we're going in terms of um, looking forward as a district. 
I'll turn back on the side. Yeah, so we um, wanted to share with you the two programs that we're excited about right now. Edgenuity came to us uh, like in May. We heard from a rep, and we get so many rep phone calls, and I was like, okay, I'll listen to it. And at the time, I was really thinking through our math difficulties, especially in the secondary level. And when our kids need something different, some other flexible option, some other chance to try learning, what, what is it that we have to offer when we don't have a lot? And so when I watched um, the courses in Edgenuity, I was sold that this could be an option for students. And so uh, just a little bit about Edgenuity, it <coughs> offers courses in ELA, math, science, social studies, world language, CTE, and electives, as well as advanced placement classes at the high school level. It has courses for 6th through 12th grade currently, and it has a variety of options about those courses. So you can take a full rigorous, it's, the courses are by semester, but you can take a whole semester course or a whole year, two semesters of course, and it is the entire full curriculum for the year. But you can also, there's other courses there that are for credit recovery, so you don't have to do the whole course. So if you fail Math 1, let's say, as a freshman, you can take Math 1 in Edgenuity, and the teacher who's working behind the scenes, like one of our teachers, can reduce the number of sections the student has to pass or the number of units the student has to pass. And the student takes a little bit of a placement test. So if they've shown mastery in anything, they don't have to do any of those modules or any of those units. So they're really just focusing on the stuff that they didn't master when they were in Math 1, and that gives them that credit recovery at the end of taking the course. And then there's also uh, modules for intervention. So when we see students at the secondary level that are truly reading you know, three and four years below grade level, there are modules they can take to do uh, intervention for math and ELA. The course is monitored by credentialed teachers. So there's always somebody working behind the scenes, but you'll see in the photos in the next slide that there is a teacher in the panel most of the time talking the students through the, the coursework. Um, and then there's a, a lot of scaffolds built in. So what I like about it, especially for our students who struggle with attention in a regular classroom, if you miss, if, if you tuned out for five minutes, all you do is press the rewind button and you can hear the teacher again, right? There's built in um, text to speech. So when there's text there, they can have it read to them. There's text translation for our EL students and, and many other things built in. So this is kind of what it looks like. So you're sitting in front of a screen and usually it looks a little bit like this where you see maybe a model of something and then that little teacher's in the corner there and that teacher's talking to you it's a little recorded video uh, usually in about a three to five minute little episode and they're talking you through the situation and then immediately following you'll do a little bit of practice if you don't pass the practice then it will kick you back to more information deeper information so that you you learn the skill set and then again you go back into the the practice um, they use a lot of real-world examples, so you can see the middle screen there where they're bringing in, I think it's a Ferris wheel. So they're trying to make the content really relevant as they're talking about it, um, bringing in visual models all the time as they're working with the students. Um, and then at the end of each little mini unit, kids take a quiz, and that's where a teacher on the back end is uh, helping grade, or especially looking when it's not like a multiple choice question or something that's more of a deeper response the teacher would grade it on the back end and then also provide input to the student if they need some pull out you know the, the screen is not always going to serve the student's needs so there's times when a teacher might have to work with the student on the content um, Cheryl that's one of our teachers it can be and in most cases it will be so what we're thinking about doing we've already piloted it this summer we used it in a math 2 credit retrieval course over summer and Sean Jackson was the teacher so the students were working at home um, on their own time, and he was basically behind the scenes making sure that they were making progress, checking in with them if they weren't. Um, in the case of this school year, what we want to do is try it in a, a course section, a Math 3 course section. So let's say that is third period. Every day, these third period kids will come and do a Math 3 course. They'll sit at Chromebooks. Um, and they will work on these modules, and then Sean is actually gonna teach that course. So what he'll do is when he sees students aren't making progress, he'll pull them to a round table and work with them one-on-one -on -one or come over and check on them, and then he'll also be doing the behind the scene things uh, as far as like the grading and the feedback that kids might get. 
Um, he also has the ability, like I was saying with the credit retrieval, he has the ability to reduce the number of units or shorten the unit if he feels that certain content doesn't need to be covered or they don't need to you know, finish certain things. We still want to use it this during the school year as a credit retrieval option. We saw it as a good option for students over summer. Um, we learned over summer that students who are not independent workers, they do need a little bit more support, so it is difficult for a student who uh, does have focus or attention issues, so we're excited to see it during the school year where we'll be more able to interact more with the student and provide that adult support uh, if it's needed. Um, we can and may use it for a schedule conflict. There are these times at Nordoff where there, a student wants to take two singleton courses and they're offered the same period, so this is another opportunity that we could offer a student um, a course in Edgenuity. Um, and then potentially, as you know, we're going to be talking about the option of um, bringing in an independent study program here, and so that this is a great idea for how to support uh, the needs of students in independent study. Um, especially making sure that we're able to offer them rigorous uh, curriculum. And then we often have a problem with students who go on home hospital. Right now, if a high schooler goes uh, on home hospital, they're assigned a teacher. That teacher has to go coordinate with six teachers at Nordoff. Sometimes we have cases where the home hospital teachers are being asked to teach something like Math 2 or Math 3, which might be kind of out of their comfort zone as a home hospital teacher. And so, Edgenuity could serve that purpose as well as offering a home hospital student that rigorous education with that teacher in the corner and those recorded videos teaching them lessons so that they can stay um, caught up on their subject matter and especially if they're only going to be out for let's say a month whatever unit they were going to be covering in their class we can just hand select that unit out of Edgenuity and they could be keeping up as their home with whatever ailment they have. I, can, I just, I'm curious about using it in the classroom, yeah. which would suggest that, that this model is better than what we're doing in the classroom currently. I don't know if we could say it is better. I think first we have to try it. Okay. And then I would say it's probably still not going to be better. It's going to be an alternative, right? I mean, I think that what we know about kids is they all don't learn in the same way. And for some students, learning in this manner might be easier for them. And then if... But if that's what the class is, then then do you get to choose that way versus regular classroom? Potentially down the road, this particular course is going to be offered to students who struggled in math too. Oh. So we're trying to see if there's an alternative for students that didn't do as well in our traditional math one and our traditional math two. The other thing that we can eventually do is if we have kids who want to take those advanced classes, right, beyond kind of what we're able to, to offer, and let's say there's an AP class mm -hmm. that they would want to take and there's only four or five kids and we can't have a section for them, we could have a teacher assigned to a section and we could have several kids in different kind of AP classes Correct. at the same time during essentially like an independent AP period and they can have access to that advanced coursework that we wouldn't be able to provide with them otherwise given the limitations of having a small school. So you're saying there might be like 24 kids in the classroom right. but five of them might be doing yes. this, five yes. of them might be this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it allows us options to expand learning for students. Yeah. And I, I, my son did edgenuity, this is oh. part of why I'm asking, but my understanding is that um, parents have access as well to see what, at least the version that we used, we, I can see if progress is being made. That's is a that great true? question. And if he used it and you could see it, I'm sure it exists. I haven't asked that question or dug okay. in much as far as how what parents can see from the program. But if we're working on one of our values is engaging parents as much as possible, this just provides us another opportunity to, to have an activity that supports our, our core values. Mm -hmm. What I like about it too, especially with the parent component, is right now parents have to go find, you know, if my s child doesn't understand this concept, I'm trying to go on to Khan Academy and do a bunch of searches and find some kind of help so that I can help my child, right? And if they're working out of a program like this, then it's right there for them in a really high quality way and the parent can be sitting next to their student and helping them with the content. Especially with things like math where a lot of parents don't remember. So, and you so have to know what something's called. Yeah. I mean, right. like if right. you go to Khan Academy, you have to know what that section right. is. Right. Yeah. Right. Sorry. No um, so, so there are students right now who are 
signed up for Mr. Jackson's Math 3 course who presumably don't know that it's actually going to end up, if we approve this, being a flipped classroom, as you said. I don't know what's been communicated to students as of yet. They don't. I know. I know that we were discussing it back in June, and so I'm not sure how they've placed students in the course. And and we're not. We are not stuck to this. This goes back to something that Tiffany was saying. If it is flopping, Mr. Jackson is quite capable of teaching Math Three in the traditional way. So it's providing an additional tool for him to yeah. support students. My experience with it was that. There's a lack of motivation. It's really hard to get through. Mm -hmm. It, you know, it's just a delivery service. Yeah. So I would almost see it as being something that you would use with for the AP classes we can't offer, rather than I can see it, it being used for um, credit um, retrieval. Retrieval. Thank you. But in the classroom, I'm I'm skeptical. I have to say. That said, if, if it provides a real, kind of a real-time assessment of the student doing certain things, I could also see that sort of pulling along a student who would otherwise procrastinate. You know, there's, mm -hmm. I was the sort of student who, if, if I had to do something constantly in front of me, mm -hmm. that kept me much more focused than if I knew a week from now I'm going to take a test and i got to pay attention until then. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, right. plus you do have the weekly, you are meeting the teacher daily, whereas, right, you know, Gabe was not, you know, or somebody who's on at home. It's a different thing, and that's right. where the parents who are choosing, if we got, start talking about independent study options, you have to know your child. We deal with that all the this time. This will not be a good option for 100% of kids. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say that the challenge with the teacher is we know in the classroom setting, not only do we have to be doing tier one good core instruction, but we also need to be doing tier two. We need to be pulling kids aside and giving them that, that small group instruction or that one-on-one -on -one instruction. And this frees up a classroom teacher to try to do that, right? So, and again, we're gonna see if it's successful or not. We don't know how it's gonna go, but, but what I get excited about with this one and both levered is that this allows the teacher to let the core group move forward with the curriculum as they're working in ingenuity, and they can pull three kids aside and take that time that they wouldn't be able to take if they were doing that direct instruction. And so if you can get more tier two embedded into a classroom, which is hopefully what we can do with something like this, it could be very, very successful. And again, we're, it's worth a shot, right? We don't know. Well, where I'm optimistic is like a, you know the real time ability to see where a student is. Yeah. I mean, no matter how often a, a teacher is gonna you know assess students, whether it's homework, whatever, <coughs> it's still you know the, the the most you're gonna do it presumably is gonna be every day by requiring a student to do some homework or some. Right. But you could see it in real time this mm -hmm. way. I mean, presumably you you can just monitor like so and so is right. just not. Hasn't made it through right. this unit. So I'm going to sit been... down next to so and so right. and engage where I might not if I were in a traditional classroom. Well, and I I like the part where the parent can engage as well because we do have a lot of parents who want to help their children, and the children come home with a book that they can't. If I you know trying to teach my child math three is not going to be an easy thing to do, right? If my child comes home and can log into Edgenuity and I can watch with my child and help them through the the unit that's actually gonna help the parent access helping the child, right? Where the, I just don't think that they can do that right now at all. Even with a book, you know, the, yeah. the, the kid will say, well, no, that's not what the teacher said. <laughs> <laughs> we get to watch the teacher together. Yep, we're so, watching them together. Yep. Always. So, that is very true. Uh, you do. For those parents that want to help, I think it provides that access also. I love technology. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Uh-oh, did we lose my... Well, was there, there more? Okay. On this? Yes. So yeah. the, the other online learning program is Levered, and our teachers, our fourth grade teachers, just participated in a three-hour training yesterday, um, and loved it. Um, it's an interactive math curriculum. Uh, what's great about it is it really allows you to provide education to your wide range of students, which is always the battle. And it was designed with the teacher in mind. So there are opener activities that the teacher does with the whole class. And it is just beyond amazing. So the, all of the standards, if you will, are broken down in these data sets. 
And what it does for the teacher is it tells them where the core students are getting stuck. And then it says, these are the openers that you should use as the teacher. So you're opening with the stuff that you know the most students are having difficulty with, right? But then, let's say you have your advanced students and you have a small cluster of advanced students that are stuck on a level, let's say five units from there. What you can do is take that opener, and you might not do it whole group, you might then set your students free to work in levered, and it's online, and they've got headphones on, but you pull that advanced group of kids, those five kids, and you do an opener with them where it's you as the teacher doing direct instruction. And then what's interesting is what's built into it is when kids are getting stuck on units, it'll red flag the groups of students and what they're getting stuck on, and then it will give you, the teacher, the supplemental materials. This is the hardest part for teachers, right? When we know a group of kids are struggling, then we have to go to all of our, our, our bag of tricks, right? All of those supplemental programs that we bought on Teachers Pay Teachers or all these places and go, okay, I think this might work for these kids. This program gives them to you. It says, do these activities with these kids. This is, this is what they're getting stuck on and this will help them get past this level. It really has thought through everything and the data and it collection sounded also like you know so you get like these five students are struggling at the same spot like you get to yeah. see yeah like, grouping them together or... right and then the other really great uh, piece is the way the data is um, showcased for the teacher is that you have all the foundational skills laid out and then you have the critical skills and then you have advanced skills and then you have en enrichment so uh, what the trainer was saying is right now what we do is, and we, we know this in our test scores, you know, we get through the unit, we knew it was going to take us three or four weeks, we got through it, the kids have taken the unit test, a lot of kids didn't pass it, and we go, okay, maybe I'll spend like one more week on this, and maybe we do, but then at the end of one more week we say, we've just got to get, we just got to move on, we, you know, we've got to move on to the next level. This provides data that says, basically, do not move on until at least 80% of your classroom has gotten through the critical standards. So you have that data in real time every day to see if they made it through those critical standards. The kids who haven't made it through the critical standard, or have made it through, they can go on to enrichment, they can go on to um, the advanced units, and what he was saying is they can also go back. So if you've already you know, gone through the decimals unit and you're on to fractions, and you had kids who made it through the foundations, made it through the critical standards, made it through a little bit of the advancement, you can send them back to that unit if they're already past fractions and, and send them back to decimals to do the enrichment or the, so you're really allowing your advanced kids to really cover so much material that we just really wouldn't be able to do without this high quality um, online program. And there's also a, a peer mentor, so kids who are yes, advanced can, part. there's a little flag where they say, I, I'm available to be a peer mentor and then I need help. You know, so you're really good at math and I need help. I, I flag that I need help and it doesn't first go to the teacher, it goes to a peer mentor with our advanced kids who can go back and, and help peer to peer with our, our kids who are And these are all pre-approved by the teacher and the teacher can turn them off at any time. So if it looks like a student is being a mentor too much and not doing their own work, you can just stop them mentor the rest of the period, but it has a lot of really neat things built in. I would say the most exciting thing is the data that they've seen. This is the first year they have the full curriculum for fourth grade available. They only had decimals and fraction units when they were um, doing some pilot work in Chula Vista. And what you're seeing here is at the bottom you're seeing all of California, fourth grade, going from the 16-17 school year to the 17-18 school So this is the year. same group of kids. That's why this is important. So these are the same group of kids in third grade and then how they test in fourth Correct. grade. And then you see Ojai, and then you see all of Chula Vista minus the schools that piloted, and then you see the schools that piloted. And what is really interesting is a lot of times you see growth, like in California, you see the kids in the lowest band. The red band is did not meet standard. The yellow band is nearly met and then the two greens are met and exceeded, you oftentimes move kids out of the did not meet into the nearly met, because a lot of our intervention is focused on those lowest end kids, right? But what ends up happening between third and fourth grade is we start to lose kids out of our exceeded and out of our met, and our yellow band gets bigger, and you see this as a trend everywhere. And what, what Levered has really proven that their program does is it moves all kids from every band forward. Right? We are providing opportunities with a program like this for our kids who are not meeting standards to move up into the nearly met standards, the nearly met kids to move up into the met, and the met students to move up into the exceeded because every kid has an option 
to move at their pace, but also to be really guided by that data. And that's, that's the core of a PLC, right? Using that data to decide what the next step in learning is for the kid. And this really, truly has that all built into the program. Every fourth grade teacher was completely sold on this program. It was optional for them to participate. And yeah. it's great. very cool and very exciting. It just sounds a little bit like we're automating our teacher. <laughs> no, Actually, no. It's the opposite. No. Yeah. It's the opposite. Um, the, the person who's really working on this program was a teacher for 20 years, an administrator, and he says he really built it with the idea that you really, those programs that are online programs really are not superior without the teacher being the forefront of the educational experience. And that is, the teacher is the mastermind as far as when kids move units, looking at that data, and that teacher pulling those small groups all the time to work wherever that need is, working with that teacher, that is the key to the success of the program. It essentially hmm. provides guidance to the teacher yeah. on direct instruction exactly and intervention. It doesn't necessarily provide that. And so it's, because it's, it's hard when you're a teacher and you do an online program and now I'm just gonna sit here at the front of the room while my kids are doing stuff and it, it's, it's- Wait till somebody struggles. Right, and how do you know? And right. it's difficult, which is ultimately, Edgenuity has those issues. We know it has those issues. This is a model in which it's really saying, we know you as a teacher have to engage with kids in order for them to learn. And so we're providing you that with this backup of all of this data, this access to supplemental reading materials based on what your kids need. So it's taking that, essentially the ability to analyze real-time data and then feeding to teachers what their next step should be. Yeah. I'm sure that's why they call it Levered, right? It's Levered. actually Lever Ed, but Levered. that's okay. Actually, he was calling it Levered in the training. I know. And I <laughs> We'll, we'll divide. It's like That's Houghton fine. Mifflin and Houghton Mifflin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, good. Any, so any so we we buy the fourth grade, mm -hmm. um, and which essentially is the same cost as our uh, text, supplemental books as yeah. our supplemental books would have been, and then we get yeah, the pilot of fractions for third and fifth grade for free. Yep. Because we're part of this early intervention pilot group. But each student needs a Chromebook. Yep. Uh huh. And where are those coming from? We have, we are looking at our entire technology plan, and I think I sent this to you in a Friday update, but we're piloting one-to-one -one take home Chromebooks for our fourth graders in anticipation of the teacher signing on to this. And so rather than buying kind of carts, we're taking those same machines and instead sending them home with fourth grade students in a one-to-one -one take home device initiative so that they can have access to this. They have access to the Wi-Fi. If you do not have access to a Wi-Fi, we will provide you either with um, information about how to get a low-cost hotspot, or we will provide you with a district hotspot. Great. So just to clarify, Edgenuity is a high school level, yeah. multi-subject platform, and and Leverage is elementary math only. Yeah. Okay. And actually, only fourth grade full curriculum right now. Oh, They're expanding okay. as a company. They have decimals and fractions for third and fifth. And they're expanding based on what they see are the highest, the, so that essential standards that we're talking about, what really matters for kids in the future, and it's decimals and fractions. If you don't get that, you don't get physics later, you don't get algebra later, you don't get chemistry later, because the ability to understand fractions as ratios is really critical. So they're taking out those pieces that are really the long-term essential standards and saying all kids will learn this guaranteed curriculum. Yep. Any other questions on that? That sounds right to me. Do we look have forward a to next year to bringing approve? you new results. I'll move to approve. I'm excited. Is there a second? I'll second, though I didn't know this was a motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that's Aye. unanimous independent study. So now that we have an online program for 6th <laughs> through 12th grade. Good thing you did in this order. That, that it took was, a long it was time. not an accident. <laughs> uh, Cheryl actually came to me this morning and said, are they in the right order? <laughs> I said, yes. Um, we'd like to use that option to provide additional options for our students, right? We know that there's no one path and no one solution for all students. And right now, because we're small, we have limited options. And so we're really interested in providing additional opportunities for students who need something different 
in sixth through 12th grade. So we're bringing to you the option to start an independent study school. We've had an independent study program in the past with varying degrees of success depending on um, how it was implemented. Uh, the problem that Cheryl was describing with home hospital also happened with independent study where we would go and like knock on the teacher's door and say, oh, by the way, you forgot to give me two weeks of lesson plans for, for Johnny and then, you know, maybe I throw something together and it, it, it wasn't implemented in a way that was systematic and now that we have this access to technology and a program that allows us to, to fix some of those issues that were in place that caused it to ultimately kind of be dis used. Mm -hmm. So Tiffany talked a little bit about, you know, the need for it. Our, certainly we have situations where students need a flexible option um, and we really want to be able to create that flexible option, lots of flexible options, and this is just one more way. Um, so Can you actually just ask a question? I remember when one of my kids was in elementary school, there was a, girl, a young lady who had anxiety and she was there, she was gone a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so how would that work? But when she was there, she was enjoying it. And I mean, how, would somebody, in terms of like our, our ADA, how would? It, it's is, gonna yeah. depend on the kid, but we do have kids who are on home hospital currently mm -hmm. for social anxiety. Yep. And so the idea is that they either can access this, so let's say, I mean, it's, it's really going to depend on what they need, but let's say they still want to remain enrolled in Nordoff and they're going to be out on anxiety for, we can use Edgenuity just as a platform, but they're still enrolled in Nordoff. But if we have a student that's like, I can never go back to that school because I am too anxious about kids or whatever makes them anxious, we can actually disenroll them from Nordoff and re-enroll them in this program. So it, it's individualized based on what they need. Uh, so, as we were thinking about the, the description, the program description and curriculum, um, we really wanted to make sure it was obviously flexible and individualized, which it will be. Edgenuity's online platform is what's going to allow us to have really good, rigorous curriculum and instruction for every student all the time, where we didn't really have that. It was um, hit or miss, it depended on the teacher, and it depended on their ability to communicate with other teachers at times to really make sure that the student was receiving what they needed. Um, these courses will be taught by fully credentialed teachers uh, and well, our plan right now is that if you enroll in Ojai Independent, you still could enroll in courses at the traditional high schools. Uh, we're thinking two electives provided that there's space in those electives for the students. They can also enroll in Ventura College and do dual enrollment um, classes. Uh, so in order to get, say, band and dance or yes, something. Yes, that's exactly, exactly right. It's things that you can't take online. I, band and dance, yep. choir. Uh, and then, so what will happen is when they enroll, they'll sit down with an administrator and talk about their, their goals. We uh, would encourage every student to take six courses per semester like they would normally do if they were at Matillaha or Nordoff, but the path for doing that can be very different. So if I'm a student who you know, really struggles with math, I might want to do my, just focus on my math course for the first three or four weeks and just get that over with so that I can be done with math. And then maybe I take uh, English, history, and science for the remainder of the semester. Or um, maybe I do two courses first and then two more courses while I'm taking a course at BC and in dance at Nordoff. So it's really going to be a matter of sitting down with the administrator at the end of the year, that will be Becky, and saying, you know, here's my plan, here's the six courses I'd like to take this is the different puzzle pieces of how and when I want to take them as I go through the, as I progress through the semester. And students in an Dana, independent study. are you just like giddy? Oh, I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Good. How many, how many years I, yeah. yeah so years. if you wanted to, if, if Nordoff didn't offer a course and you wanted to do it on ingenuity, ingenuity that's a possibility. You, but so you're not enrolled in this program. So so that's the piece I want to be study. clear about. Right. So You'd be a Nordoff student. Yes. If you're a Nordoff student, you can use Edgenuity without enrolling. So this is yeah. essentially a school. You're disenrolled okay. from Matillaha or Nordoff or Chaparral, and you are taking this as a school for your entire program of study. Mm -hmm. You can also, because we're all about options, you can also use Edgenuity in your regular home school just as a supplementary piece and we just schedule schedule you into a course depending on what that looks like does and it what cost us for each 
Yes. Student enroll. Yes. So any it, student who was already doing six classes but wanted to add another one, would we do that? Yeah, well, so not exactly because no. there are licenses, <laughs> but it's sold by concurrent licenses. So that means that they, if I have 30 licenses, it just means only 30 licenses, only 30 students can be on at the same time. Uh -huh. They don't kick you off. Ingenuity doesn't kick anybody off, but they track it. So if they end up tracking that we have more like 40 students on, they're going to call us and say, you need to buy 10 more licenses. But what my point is, is if you have a student who's enrolled in five classes at Nordoff and taking one Ingenuity <coughs> class, one, one course is not the equivalent of one license because that student is not likely to be on at the same time as other students, right? Because there's going to be variability there. And they track all that on the back end, and then they tell us how many concurrent licenses we were really averaging. Well, I'm, I was thinking of, I've had a handful of kids say, I don't want to take Spanish. I wanted to take sign language. Could right. they decide, yes. I don't want to those take Spanish. Those are the Spanish. kind of yes. we can have, yeah. And are we letting those kids who were enrolled in French classes last year, who then we kind of cut off that program, know that they could finish the three years of French that they wanted to do originally this so, way? That's the part where I don't know. We'll have to talk about how far we want to expand. I still see this as you know moving into sort of piloting phases. We still need to talk about who is the teacher on the back end doing these things. Where's who's doing the workload? Um, but the answer really is yes. I mean we can do these things. So we just need to figure out how to do it. Very good. Just starting with the yes. Yes. And then yes. Right. Let's figure out how. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good model. I I have one criticism. Can we come up with a cooler name than Ojai Independent School? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. Can you? <laughs> Maybe I think I think we can. I would I would actually tell you Oxnard Union has the same. Actually, most Ventura is starting a similar program. They are all having this similar program. Um, Oxnard Union has one. We were talking about this. Their logo is a little troll, uh, <laughs> like with the computer. They're, they're like the, they're the Oxnard Trolls. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we're, we're taking a more traditional approach here. Sure. But, uh, <laughs> At some point, I mean, what school did you graduate from? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Are we giving diplomas out for well, yes. independent school? Uh -huh. yes. And we want to talk about getting WASC accredited as well. So we do want to make sure that people know that there is a profile of a student who is successful in an independent study program. It is independent study, right? So there is definitely an expectation that the student can work independently, is self-motivated, um, has good time management skills, and if there are issues around a student not having those things, we would really need to problem solve for them to be able to be successful in an independent study program. So it's important that, that parents understand when we're talking about flexibility and alternative options, um, this isn't necessarily for every student. Not every student is going to be success successful in an independent study program. So if you're failing your classes at Nordoff, enrolling in Ojai Independent, is it magically going to potentially no, no. solve all of your problems? There are other things that we would, would want to work for. And that initial assessment is really the family sitting down with Becky and Becky saying, are you sure you want to do this? Right. <laughs> so and Becky will then be the principal of independent and chaperone. Yes. But no longer be teaching. So when someone goes into Ojai Independent and it turns out that despite our best screening and planning, they're not succeeding, this is structurally not compatible, mm -hmm. do we have a, a process to, to yep. they can re mandate in order. movement or they can is re it voluntary? Uh, no, if you're not successful. I mean, it's just like students that we have anywhere who, who aren't being successful, right? We can continue to work on improvement plans. You could re-enroll in your home high, home school if that's necessary. Um, chaparral may be an option, or it may be that you know we don't have a program that that serves your needs at this point. Right. So, is that? I mean, we haven't. We're not there yet, obviously. Yeah. But I mean, do we anticipate that that would be a guided decision or a mm -hmm. district decision? Yeah, we talked about how um, if we see that you're not making progress. You know what are the benchmarks so if we see that you haven't logged on in a week it's a call from becky if we see that you haven't logged on in seven days it's a you must come in and meet with us if we see that you had so there there are a series of benchmarks and correlating actions on our part that eventually lead to hey you haven't logged in in two weeks this yeah. is not going to work for you so let's find another option it's like cyber truancy right? yes I mean, right it's, essentially it's yes like new concepts for a new Mm -hmm. Well, it actually is cyber Yeah. <laughs> because it's 
attendance for student on independent study is based on work and completion. So each each week the student would have assignments for you. This is the expected work based based on our agreement. This is what you're going to be working on. Um, let's say they get 20 percent of that work done. They get credited with one out of five days attendance. Um, so it. Yeah. I, well, I love the focus on the work, you know, because we so often in school environments, you know, almost penalize or, or resist somebody who found a way to figure out how to, and it's like, that's great. You found out a way to do it. Yeah. Good. You could actually graduate early yeah. in this right. program. If yeah. you were very dedicated, you could get out yeah. of high school in a very quick time frame if that was important to you. Instead of the rangers, they could be the lone rangers. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep trying on that. <laughs> anyway, the idea is that it will be rigorous. There will be 25 to 30 hours a week. We want them to come in once a week for appointments. Uh, that will be with Becky. And then there will be additional lab hours for those students who are struggling, because there will inevitably, inevitably be some students who struggle, um, maybe in a subject matter here or there, or several. And so there will be more opportunities than just once a week to come in and be face-to-face -face with somebody like Becky to sit down and help get the student through the stuff. And this through is the all through Edgenuity. And right now. And Edgenuity is A to G compatible, mm -hmm. or uh, yep. compliant. Yep. compliant. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and AP. They have AP as well. So how does the, because I thought to be A to G, the science um, classes have to have labs. Yeah, we talked about lab sciences. Okay. So we have options for lab science. Um, you can go to Nordoff for lab science. We can we can talk about that. You can co-enroll in um, with Ventura College. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a third option, which I don't remember. Well, science right now, is, well, Becky's so a science teacher. Yeah, So right. a, a third option that, that we talked about was I, I could, depending on what students were enrolled in what science classes they're taking, have weekly labs that are set up for the students can come in. That would be great. And these students can participate in sports at Nordoff. Right. right. And Matilla. And Matilla Hawk. Unlike a continuation high school. Yeah. They can. And, so and that dances. That would be my next and question is, is how, what's the differentiation? The state says that students at continuation high school, well, CIF yeah, yeah. says that students at continuation, continuation high school may not occur. The CIF. So it's a CIF rule. We can't yes. do anything about it. Okay. I didn't realize that. So I talked a little bit about the schedule and how it might be different for each student. Um, and basically, um, we're hoping to get five or ten students to enroll this year. Uh, Becky will be the administrator as well as a teacher working behind the scenes in ingenuity, tracking the students' progress and helping provide feedback. Um, we would use this site as the meeting place for lab hours and once a week visits. And then our goal is to work with WASC right away to have them come out for a spring visit. We need to have at least five students to five, have five WASC yeah, five come out. Um, but if we become, a, we'd like to become accredited by the end of the year. Out of curiosity, how how long has this been percolating? Who's been driving this? A phone call from a parent? <laughs> yeah, it's a phone, two weeks phone ago? call from a parent two weeks ago. It's really great. <laughs> Actually, Edgenuity, I think, is the tool that's going to allow us to operate. We already were had the it's structure, the but we had a parent call who had put some number of kids, four pre previous kids, through independent study, and then the last two years we said, no, no independent study, we're not doing it. And so I'm new. So she called me and said, uh, previously we've been told, no, not possible. And, not answer, yes. and I said, well, I don't know why we don't do it, but let me see why we don't do it. We started having this conversation and said, I absolutely think we can serve this parent who wants to bring her kid back to the district who's currently in a unnamed other competing place. And uh, and then in talking to, to that, and then like talking to Angie, talking to parents at our events, it seems like there's actually quite a bit of um, appetite in the community for this kind of alternative program and that people leave our district because we only have one option for them at middle school. And so, sense, I think, yeah, I can see Ohio being how do, you, how do you get the word out if we pass this? Uh, we pull campaign and I mean we, we actually don't want 40 kids enrolled tomorrow <laughs> we, we really want like five to ten kids but uh, 
I, I, also, we've talked to the principals. We talked to Javi and, and we talked to Carol and we talked to Nordoff and they were saying, oh, so we don't have to refer kids to Valley Oak Charter? <laughs> No, you do not have to refer kids to Valley of Charter anymore. We have our own option here. So I think a lot of this will actually be internal referrals um, as we, we work with our sites. And they say, you know, we have this kid that we notice just isn't quite <coughs> making it here, isn't thriving, and, you know, we'd like you to talk to the family about if this would be a good option for them. And there are currently seven waiting to hear what the results are here. <laughs> okay, good. Seven. <laughs> And so, at what point is this cost effective? At Five. two. Yeah, <laughs> but, but because essentially we're pulling Becky out of the classroom, right? So it's actually, I think, three kids with the ADA gives us. And then at some point, if we get 10, then we have to think about adding another teacher um, because that becomes not possible for Becky to do all of that. But we have some home hospital programs. There are some other places that we could potentially pull from. Um, and do some co, have some, some teachers who are doing co assignments. Well, it's not going to be full time. I mean, the teacher's obviously not going to be engaged right. remotely. Right. Like a, yeah. I don't want to use the term regular. Yeah. But regular teacher. Mm -hmm. right. So there's some ideas that we can have around flexibility yeah. for that. And, you know, we currently do that with Home Hospital. We find teachers who kind of teach in this. It's a very similar model. It's just now we have all the support and we have the structure, and, and you don't have to unenroll from school. I'm excited. Well, I like this. I, I think it's you know it's evidence of what we've been talking about of, of you know of us us morphing to meet our students' needs rather than them having to morph to meet what we want. Like. So I, I like this. Great. Is there a motion to approve? Oh, thank you. you should be the one. All right. I will move to approve. <laughs> I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right. 7.4.1, designation of representative to Ventura County Schools. So funding authority. You've seen this before. This, this could actually have been on the I'll consent, second. but. Uh, Do we have a second? Jay? Yes. Second. second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous measure J update. Yay. Yeah. Phew, fine. It's all done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good news is we're still standing. So, um, yeah, it's been a busy summer, but we are still, again, still here. So, um, as Javi said, until uh, gym is a little bit behind the locker rooms, I should say, the gym uh, is freshly painted. The the roll forming uh, for the metal roof actually starts tomorrow. It's being delivered late tonight. So I encourage you all to go out there Friday and watch it and be kind of neat. Um, so they're going to stack all the metal panels up on the roof and get it ready so that the gym will still be usable for the first day of school while they're finishing up the metal panels. Um, but yeah, it's pretty exciting. Uh, the rest of the stuff, as you can see, we are wrapping up a lot of the stuff. The Miner's Oaks painting, the Topa Topa painting, uh, they're down to the punch list items. Actually, Alan gave the final blessing on Topa Topa painting today. Um, so that's that's great. Miner's Oaks, we have a few things that we'll tackle, but uh, we're getting there. Miramani ground units is, are done. Uh, Miner's, all the roofing, we are doing a walk tomorrow morning to establish just punch list items except for the cdr um, or except for what the cdr no cdr included. included oh really yes uh the only one that will probably be slightly more than punch list items is san antonio um and they are actually just they're probably going to be working through the weekend just to knock that out it's just taking a little bit longer with the tiles i've been uh watching them you've been watching yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah me too Forum and uh Actually, they made a lot of progress today. I mean, it's yeah. kind of I mean, you can tell they have to stage because it's so steep. Yeah. And a lot of it was just staging for it, but now they're cranking pretty good. Yeah, and the the west side, the Carn Road side, has been is a little trickier because there is on the back side there's a little platform where they could stack all the tiles. On this side, it is just like you said, it's just staging. They're handing up tiles um, as they go, but uh, it, looks it, it looks fantastic. Yeah. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah. So. Uh, all the other roofs are punch list items that, again, like I said, we will actually walk tomorrow and knock that out. Uh, 
Topa Topa gutters uh, will be installed next week. They brought the wrong color gutters today, but no big deal. Um, it's not affecting the roof. Uh, the Matilla Hot Paving, as Javi said, is uh, the front section of the staff lot had a slurry and it'll be restriped uh, probably Friday and then we'll be done. So, uh, what about paying. the um, Miramani, yeah, Miramani playground. playground? So, Miramani Playground, they paved today. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> after watching what they did, and I mean, they essentially took a massive rototiller and you know rototilled in the concrete mix after they'd already excavated the dirt, like we talked about. That they did that on a Friday, on yeah, Monday morning, we went out there with Ohio Sanitation. To Ohio Sanitation was nice enough to come out, and they w took the big vacuum truck and they s cleared all of our drains while they were open, and they drove an eighty thousand pound truck across that playground, and it didn't budge at all. <laughs> To the point where, I mean, before that, one of us would walk across it and it was like this. So it was pretty impressive. Is that uh, to say Palmer? Palmer brought yeah. His stuff out? Yeah, his team brought it out. It's a good dude. So it was nice. They were fantastic. They spent a day and a half at Miramonic just cleaning the drains for us. So. I remember this is Jeff Palmer. So yeah. You know, and he was on one of our committees. I can't remember. He was on the COC committee. He was at some point, yeah, he was talking about something and Chuck was like, somebody goes, oh, I'll bring some stuff. I'll help yeah. you out. Yeah, Chuck was. Uh, gracious enough and set it up actually and um, Jeff was fantastic they actually cameraed the line so we know now you know down in the future where we need to put a manhole that'll make the whole cleaning out process even easier so they were great cool so yes it, it will be done um, they paved today they will start striping it uh, tomorrow or Friday and we gave them the plan and it'll it, it's gonna be nice uh, the drainage is fantastic on it uh, they even did a bunch of grading up on the field to help keep, to help funnel water down the field a little bit better and keep it off of the new asphalt. So uh, we put in a new sleeve for Chuck to make sure in the future we can run conduit underneath it. So uh, there were a few extras that uh, Quality Pavement was able to just give us. So it was nice. Um, we should keep a record of that. Yeah. The extras. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's. They've, they've been great, quality paving. Um, Nordoff track is done. Hopefully hopefully you all have been out there running laps. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've been waiting to hear from you. Yeah, exactly. we, did, uh, we did a Facebook page post on that, and we did have somebody say, the grass looks terrible. Uh, we had to turn off the water while we were doing the track. Correct. So the grass does look terrible. Uh, from our picture, but the picture was about the track, but now we've uh, turned the, the grass a little stressed, but we're turning the water back on, and so the grass will green up. We didn't kill the grass. Right. Taking a little hiatus. about 10 days where we had to yeah. not water due to the track. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the quad, if anybody's been there for any events at Nordoff recently, is demoed and currently being reconstructed so um, it's they are going at light speed as well i had so. somebody come to me concerned about the exposed roots on the uh, trees that are there are there, we you, alan there gets there are, that actually there are two oak trees that we're seeing mm -hmm. there is literally a hole this big that has some two inch roots exposed uh, that we've covered up. But oh and they have been covered yeah i mean, yeah. I mean it's Minimal. We were surprised when we took down the seat walls around the two trees. We thought there'd be roots that mm -hmm. we see. Yeah. We go down. They don't yeah. go out like some trees do. Uh -huh. We've actually had Treco, the arborist, the um, district arborist that we've been using. They've been out there checking everything a few times to make sure the oaks aren't stressed. Everything's good. And we're watering. We're soaking them about once a week. For the arborist. Yeah. Uh, You want to touch on the drain line that we rerouted as well? Yeah, we rerouted the drain line. That will come in as a small extra. Uh, but the, uh, uh, we rerouted drain lines to, to stay away from the roots of those trees because we just had to get the water, storm water to the drain. We didn't have to go right through the middle where all the roots were. Yeah. So we took it on an angle uh, to save that. So, yeah, the, root, the, the two oaks are being well tended to that's for sure great thank you no problem
Um, other than that, they are they're they're moving at an amazing pace. So uh, Dave Munson was you know, excited after he got over a shock of seeing the quad area. Mm. He was excited about you know the, yeah. pro the process. So. What will be something? Yeah. Is there any line shooting starting to cover up this weekend? Are we starting to put in the, the, uh, the seat walls and the boulders? We selected 38 boulders today. Let's put them back. Uh, I think the quarry will be a nice little market down here. Wow. Uh, we've contacted them. We selected them. Well, it's coming along nicely. Uh, and the building portion, the library portion, we actually have out to bid right now, as well as the Matilla Hall kitchen. They are both open, and uh, we have the job walk for the, the pre bid walk actually tomorrow morning for the kitchen, and the following week we have it for the library. So, with a tentative, assuming you know the bids come back within budget, everything looks good uh, in both bid packages we have a November 1st start date for both projects um, with the anticipation of the, both of those being done I think we have 273 days that puts it at about July 15th which um, the kitchen is still doable it's going to be a push but it's still doable the library should be more than enough time so even if it rains yes yep. um, I just Asking theoretical questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, also, on those, on those subject, the things that we have going on, we've got several that are involving our DSA project uh, inspector. He's been fighting this for Yeah. Good. Yeah, Frank, Frank from California Code has been, yeah, he's been fantastic. Awesome. So, um, the San Antonio parking lot, we're moving along. We finally got the last topo survey. And we've already actually started working with R&T on, uh, some kitchen designs for next summer to upgrade the rest of the kitchens across the district for next summer. So, um, and we have a whole list of projects already for November, December, spring break, and summer. Uh, I will say the Miramonte parking lot, the staff lot, as well as the bus drop and the drop zone will probably be pushed until November. Uh, so we have a little more time. We have a whole week for them to slurry and properly clean it as opposed to us really trying to push it right now we decided oh, not to repave not to slurry uh right at the start of school in the middle of parent drop off and yeah. up. we decided that wasn't a good idea right. so we're gonna wait till we have some some time off when yeah. there's not daily parent drop off there. exactly and what so. about summit i mean are we looking now at there are there summit we actually have a job walk next week for the roofing a pre-bid walk i should say we already walked it we inspected it um and the main building is actually in very good shape. Uh, the two modulars do need some uh, a full replacement, to be honest with you. And so we've already sent the bid package out, and the architects are working on the actual plans, but we're going to go ahead and do the pre-bid walk next week. So that should come before you guys uh, at the September meeting for approval. And we've already talked to um, Jim Bailey mm -hmm. in regards to doing the work, and obviously he's very excited and has no problems moving his programming into another room or vacating both rooms while we do the whole thing. So how many units, I mean, this is another conversation, another time, but you know, it's, there's six classrooms up there, you know, or, do, or we just removed two classrooms from Topa Topa, so what was it's the It's the two modular buildings that were, would be done. Right, I mean, is there any discussion to removing two units at the summit? Too. Do we need all we can six? come back with it. We can do a little research and come back mm -hmm. to you with yeah. that. Okay. Maybe so when yeah. we get the bid. Yeah. You did leave that lot where we removed those two, those two classrooms that, that got paid. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't know how good of shape those classrooms were. I mean, we can we we'll do some yeah. research and see what, you know. Well, the if it, I mean compared to Topa Topa, the age right. of the ones and the ones we removed last year from Minor Oaks. Minor Oaks. Let's compare the ages, yeah. and because and all the schools are downsizing, it's not unusual for us to remove. This isn't a first time. Right. But our uh, our current license with Jim is for yeah. So we'll, we'll I'll bring it back to you some options. Okay. Yeah. The the hole at Topo where we took out in the classrooms, we did pay for that. I so heard the playground looks huge now. It does. It looks massive. <laughs> There's this open space. Um, so, and then we are meeting with a couple contractors up at Summit to establish a scope of work for the parking lot and the playground as well. 
Uh, but the first one was obviously the roofs, considering we're heading into winter. It doesn't feel like it, but it'll be here before we know it. And so will, so will you rain, I think. Mm -hmm. We're hoping for yeah. it. All right, thank you very much. No Are there questions or comments about the four items? I'm wondering why they're broken up. Is it because they're different items? Yeah. And that thing, ching, cha ching, ching. Yeah. Cha -ching. Well, yeah. I appreciate breaking it up, actually. You know, I mean, uh -huh. we we'll want to see exactly. I mean, if we hate uh, change orders. Oh, right. Yeah, the ceiling joints. As do we. Um, but yeah, I mean, the doors to the gym. Alan can speak to better. He's been living it, but it, it was one of those things where we we go to measure and we're like, of course. <laughs> Plus, that's six foot five. You only get six foot four and a half. Yeah. <laughs> now Natural, those doors naturally. are old and all. So, yeah. And do you get a chance to drive by the preschool? Yeah. I did to today. Yeah, it looks a lot better, even though it's not finished. It is not finished. It looks better than it did. It is uh, white with a, a kind of bright red trim, <coughs> um, so it's kind of probably a place to grow, which is right back here in the corner, and it looks um, not abandoned. Uh, yeah, and so uh, we turned the water on, uh, working on some signage for that. But the idea is that that, that looks like a, a school site where we have our It really children. pops off the corner now, that's for sure. Yeah, it's got so, this which is great. kind of primary color trim, so it looks preschool-y. We just need a little grass. Or we will yeah. have green. It won't be grass. <laughs> it might be weeds, but we will have green in front of the school, and we will be working on a long-term solution, uh, but it's kind of pending what happens with, with right. the property. So we're doing minimally what we can do to make it uh, a, a facility in which our, it's acceptable for our students to be there and attractive to parents. Right. Yes, we have a couple of uh, designers looking at ideas for us yeah. on how to, how to do that, and we're looking at the bids on right now for those five to 10 to do all right. If I there's, I wanted to just yeah. say thank you for sending pictures. They, I found it really helpful because I couldn't figure out what awnings were at Matilda. Mm -hmm. I was really yeah. Struggling we'll we'll try to do that course. on all of them in the future. Actually, um, that way you guys have a little more information. I asked for it. You want to see? Because I couldn't figure out what it, we were talking about. Tiffany, are we the I doors. Oh, and yeah. I didn't. Pretty soon have an action item on like, oh, um, those awnings. the final bond uh, issuance? Yes, we are actually doing the legal work right now. The good news is that interest rates are the second yes. lows they've been in history. Inverted yield curve. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, this is an excellent time to be doing that, so we will actually be bringing a resolution to you for um, approval at the September 11th meeting. So right. we can take advantage of that. Are still working with, what's his name? John Isom. Isom. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, some of our initial construction delays, we feel like we'll be able to mitigate that with our new uh, super low interest rates. And all right. So I'll move to approve 7.4.3 through 6. Very good. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Uh, moving to, thank, thank you. you. Very thank much. you. Thank you. Aye. 7.5.1, the grand jury response. Any comments, or do we have a motion to approve? I would just say there's a, a small change. We had a, a date error that was said 2000. Oh, um, right. On page four. Yes, yeah. on page four. Uh, it said 2018 slash 2020, and it should be. Um, 1819. Yeah, 1819. So just a, just a small change there. With that change? I'll move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. First reading of the recommended board policies. Can we put this to another time? Yeah, if you know Actually, I have one. I'm sorry on the on the grand jury. We're, we're late, right? Responding. I just wonder if there should be some like apology. You know, we apologize for. Yeah, we we. Cover letter. Yeah, yeah, in the cover letter there will be a hi. Just started. This was due. Unaware that it was due when it started. Yeah, I, if there's a consensus, I'm happy to move the board policy reading to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I, don't, okay. I didn't finish so anyway, it. so I only got yeah. about half of it. Well, and, and just so you can look ahead uh, with excitement, I about half of them, I'm going to suggest we just ignore. I noticed I was like, yeah. optional thing's going to bring that up. Right. <laughs> Kathy told me that. 
<laughs> All right, on to the superintendent's report. All right, I will be very quick in terms of time, and I'll just say we are so excited for school to start next week. We are all working uh, kind of maximum capacity. We have put a lot of um, people, you know, we had that little bit of money that came um, at the end of or this year from um, the, the refund from our workers comp I think it was and we are using that to get our facilities as great as they can be for the start of school so we have some extra people that we've been um, utilizing because we, we haven't done that for a while and it's impossible to get a classroom you know to get the school ready if you have if you can't even get it up to kind of baseline so we are working really hard to get grounds classrooms I get emails from teachers daily saying oh my gosh in 21 years I've never had my classroom look so clean it feels so good for me mentally and my health um, and so just that little bit of extra person power to to do that um, has been where we chose to kind of put our efforts um, we've been doing site walks at every school to walk around and say I think we should trim that bush I think we should paint that curb I think you know all those kinds of things walking through um, drop off and pick up procedures to see if there's additional signage that we need to alleviate frustration since we know that's one of our biggest pain points um, do we need crosswalks do we need whatever that looks like so that we can make sure that that goes as smooth as possible commuting out communicating out to parents through parent square drop off pick up procedures um, in small chunks so that they can say this is what I'm supposed to do so that everybody knows what they're supposed to do on the first day reinforcing that with people out there in front um, rolled out parent square communication tool we can see who is unreachable um, and so we have our office managers at each site saying we you are unreachable we didn't have an email or it bounced back or we didn't have a phone or whatever they're reaching out to make sure that we connect with those so that um, we have a hundred percent reachable parents by the time that school starts how have we rolled that out parent square uh, so so one you're automatically in the system so you get an email if we have your email in our queue system so we first rolled it out with an email to staff so that staff could create their accounts they could know what was happening we um, our principals all went to a training last week we rolled it out with an email to parents then following up with parents who didn't so get that email. I, I don't think i've got social it. media um you didn't, awesome. did, did you it, get anything from me what would it look like you should have gotten a post from me first of all in fact osla wrote back a thumbs up so maybe you're does it only go to one parent no it should go to both so we wouldn't want to make sure that you're listed in the primary contact area maybe we don't well. have your email <laughs> and that your phone number and email are there so that you get it yeah so you set up your account you can say i want texts i want emails i want phone calls i want text spanish in spanish language. i want chinese i want whatever um, so that's you get them regardless of whether you sign up but you just get the email in English the the sign up is to say set your preferences and so forth and so on so we are um, Do we have an email going out to step by step take people through to so the yeah and and they the, know how to set their preferences yeah so the great thing about parent square is it's got super super good help so if you click the little help button they help you like right now they have lots of tutorials and then if you actually need help they'll send you an email they are our first customer service support for the rollout because that's what they do right did you get yours i didn't figure out how to set my and, and, where does the email come from and the, well i sent an email so it will come well, from you i've so, yeah, got one your, from amy zuniga one from from yeah. Cheryl, but, one from Dave, one from Javier, but then it says Parent Square after it. Yeah. So like I'm a parent, so my own email came to me in my email, and it's in my personal email that said Cheryl Knox through Parent Square sends mm -hmm. you an email. Yeah. But Kevin, you also don't need the email to sign up. You can download Parent Square. You can sign in with your email, and then. No, I'm more interested in just seeing how our yeah, rollout's rolled out. going yeah. as so a person. So all I know is Osla got it because you can immediately respond back to that. I had several parents email or you know texting me back through Parent Square saying, "How do I do this?" or "How come one of my children is not on the list?" And it turns out I looked them up, and they were a stepchild, and that parent wasn't listed as a primary contact. You have to be a primary contact to be on the list. So the great thing about this rollout is it allows us to make sure we have current, accurate contact information because yeah. we can see on our end that you don't we we right. didn't get to you. Now that right. doesn't mean we can see if one parent got something and another right. parent, but 
if you just contact us with those questions, right, we had some Facebook questions like, I know a parent who didn't get an email, then we say, contact your office manager. Correct. And it helps us to make sure that we have, so, so for the first time, we have a verification method to ensure that we have all of these. Right. Right. Is it based on child? Like, you know, like if this child had a contact number versus we just yeah. tried all the emails we had. Does the district no, have like you a... You can see a printout. A, you know, a, a, a file on each... On each when you sign parent. up in Q, or when your kid enrolls, mm -hmm. you fill out contact information. Correct. Now, if your kid enrolls in kindergarten, and you may or may, you know, and then we update that one, we have to like hand update That's that right. in the system every year, uh, which may happen. Or you may, you know, maybe you change your contact information mid-year, mm -hmm. and we don't know that because you filled out your parent forms at the beginning of the school year. So, but maybe you were entered as an emergency contact, for right. example, yeah. Kevin, so and Oslo is the primary contact. And unless you're listed in that primary contact realm, you're not going to get. So we have to check with, well, office manager. That's what yeah. every parent should do who's not getting stuff. They should check in with their office manager so that your information yeah. is in the system correctly. Yeah. But I also thought you were suggesting that if we have your email, regardless of whether you're emergency or not, we send them that. No, it's only it, the primary. Maybe just be your okay. primary. So yeah, yeah I. I I mean, the, whoever the kid's primary contact information is. But if you're like a secondary person. So maybe that information also needs to go out. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. Uh, we are also sending out an, an email notification posted on Facebook that we are, all schools are closed on Monday because we have all staff day. And so we know that's a little, you know, as a parent, I'm going to knock on the door on Monday because school starts on Wednesday and nobody's there. So we'll have nice office signs. We'll be telling people in advance. We know there will be some people who will still be irritated, uh, but it's important to have that all staff day, be all staff so we can go over your new vision, um, implementation, customer service training, all, all of that kind of stuff and to have that, that day together. In the, in the future, we can think about, you know, how that day looks, but we're pulling this day together after kind of we'd set all the calendars. So uh, we will do our best to communicate that, but a heads up that that's it. And then what, when Next are one. the school actually, like, the, you know, the staff meetings at school? That we, I remember, remember we had a conversation when we were working out days, work days versus vacation days. Exactly. So there's no staff meetings on Tuesday. That is the teacher work day, and that was something that we had to talk about, right. making sure that we didn't take That's staff. What I wanted to but they have the afternoon, afternoon for their staff. So I, I'm doing the morning first two no, hours. No, I meant like the on-site, like each principal meeting with uh, their teacher. The afternoon of on oh, Monday. Most of them. Most of them. So some of them have toolbox training, but yeah. if they don't That's have right. toolbox training, the rest of them have staff meetings. So we, we are just doing the morning certificated goes to either toolbox or school meeting classified goes to customer service training can I ask a question parent square if it's says if a parent says text um, do I have to use my personal phone to no. text or does it just go through your parent square post yeah so Love you it. post okay, whatever you want and it goes to you. or it calls yeah right in their little robot voice great I just haven't yeah. 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 We're gonna train you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Robin Munson is our point of contact for the Parent Square rollout. Not in terms of actual tech support, like she's not setting up accounts, but she is our our contact. So she'll be going out to the schools to train the teachers um, and kind of troubleshooting. So she's been sending pretty much daily messages to principals about here are some things I've learned about how to best use that. Our PTOs have been asking about using it because it's a great way for them to contact, uh, to have groups. Our coaches. We're contacting groups of people you can collect money through it so we've been she's been working on all of those implementation pieces and communicating that out so uh, last thing we met with our um, classified and certificated units today to go over the two waivers as part of the necessary steps towards moving towards that state board waiver so thank you Chuck and Angie for meeting with that so we have their support for our state board of education waiver for both uh, the the lease to to have an RFP process for this property um, and then also for the district elections to not hold an election but rather to kind of follow the natural cycle election so we are uh, we now the for the yeah moving to the trustee area oh, elections right. that that's part of the process so now we have to meet with ELAC DLAC post things 
et cetera, et cetera, but we have one step of that process completed. But how about, aren't we also asking for the waiver for Summit? Uh, I meant Summit. The district oh, office waiver's already done. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Right. Intention to detail stopped at nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's it. Great. Hi, uh, any board member reports or items for future agendas? I'm excited to hear what people say when they come on campus. Yeah. All these changes. Paint jobs and stuff like that. There's some big changes. Yeah. There's lots of incremental changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that look like Those too. Yeah. Great. Yes. <laughs> All right. Then moving to the consent calendar, is there a motion to approve? Any questions, comments? I'll move to approve. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And with that, we will adjourn until next time.